This is your ultimate stop for everything sports. The Golden State Media Concepts Sports Podcast. Should I say more? From the NFL, MLB, the NBA, to MMA, it's all in here. The Golden State Media Concepts Sports Podcast. Listen now. Podcast Network. My name is Chris Blades, and before I get started today, I make sure I take the time out to remind you, as always, if you haven't already, subscribe to the podcast. Make sure you never miss an episode. Make sure you're always on top when we drop our latest stuff. Also, if you cookies as well, give us a five star rating, write us a review. Be very appreciated, very helpful. Allows you guys like what you guys dislike, the ways we can improve, all that fun stuff. And also, if you're on social media, more social media, so you can find us there: Twitter, Instagram, Facebook. We can talk, we can chat, we can debate, we can discuss. And, I mean, at this point, like, Mahomes is getting his second MVP, barring, like, a complete fall off of the cliff at this point, yes. I feel like after, and again, not that he played badly, but, I mean, it's not because like it's his best game of the season. He just, you know, just patching Mahomes again, did what he had to do, uh, obviously. Once he got the ball there at the end, you knew what the situation was. Might have been one of the easiest two-minute drills to, end to, to win a game I've ever seen in my life. Um, honestly, I mean, that, that even is before we get to the fact that the Raiders just somehow inexplicably left Travis Kelsey, who had, was having a great game up until that point. Obviously that helped cap it and that helped cap it off. Um, just left Travis Kelsey, the best receiver on the team. And, you know, you could go with Tyreek Hill, but, and, and he had a good day as well. Um, but again, the best, if not the best receiver on the team, second best and the best tight end in the league wide open. Um, look at they were playing some sort of zone. Look like they played zone a lot down in that last um, in that last possession again. I don't know. I wasn't. I, I can't. Don't have all twenty two, so I can't uh, see exactly what coverage they were in. But whatever they were doing was not working. Uh, like I said, Mahomes and company got down the field nice and easy. And scored a touchdown. I felt bad for Derek Carr because he put together a nice little drive to get them a touchdown. Um, before that, and like I said, just one of those situations where um, you just left too much time, and that's the problem with. Uh, good quarterbacks is that like you leave too much time they're gonna do what they did and then like I said it's the Chiefs they're not gonna play for the field goal and once they got going it was like hey like, let's see if Pat can you know get the touchdown to really win this thing and shocker he did and um here we are and so uh yeah yeah that was definitely a very good game Sunday night game Chiefs Raiders a very important game for the Chiefs um which again is crazy to say but on top of the fact they need to keep pace with the Steelers because we'll get to them in a second. They still haven't lost. Um, but this would have been a big loss due to the fact that if they would have lost, the Raiders would have been 7-3. and three. They would have been 8-2. and two. So not only one game up with now they're, now they've lost the tiebreaker. Like I said, because the Raiders would have, would have swept them. So like I said, if there's a tie, the Raiders would get in. And now, now they'd be the AFC West leaders. And plus, I mean... Yeah, like they still have some interesting uh, matchups left to um uh to finish out the season. They they play the Bucks next week. Yeah, they play the Bucks next next week in Tampa. They still got to go uh to New Orleans in December. They well, I mean, it doesn't really matter because it's indoors. But I said they still got to go to New Orleans. Um, and what's it called? Uh, Drew Brees could be back by then. I mean, I guess we'll see. But I think he could be back by then. Um, though, I mean, the whole rib thing, that was absurd. I didn't even know you could crack that many ribs, um, at one time. But like I said, we'll get to that in the next segment. Um, so I had to go to the Dolphins, who obviously lost to the Broncos today. Um, but again, sometimes those Miami trips are a little weird for some people. Uh, as, as we know for years, the, the Patriots had always, uh, randomly struggled down there in Miami. Um, though, you know, the, any of the, um, extra stuff like the partying and stuff is obviously out due to COVID. Um, though, you know, I know Florida's a little more open in some places. And also, again, I get, well, yeah, because well, that'd be the first time in Miami since, that was, that's where the Super Bowl was last year, right? 
Yeah, I'm like 99% sure that's where the Super Bowl was. Um, so, uh, <laughs> I'm 100% sure that's where the Super Bowl was because LIV, like, live. Um, if you know, you know. Um, but yeah, so that'd be the first time back in Miami since the Super Bowl. So, obviously, they would probably want to, uh, get that together. They still got to play the Chargers again, who are better than the 3 and 7 record, and took the Chiefs to overtime, uh, the first time around. So, again, they still have some, um, interesting matchups to, that they had left, so you couldn't really, not say they couldn't afford to drop a game, because, I mean, they're Chiefs, they can do what they wish. But, again, it just would have been rough for them to drop it, knowing that there are some games that they could, in theory, lose. Now, again, they're the Chiefs. You have Andy Reid, you have Patrick Mahomes. Um, you're going to almost every game believing you're going to win. They haven't. Um, I mean, they've won almost every game. Uh, as Al Michaels, I believe, pointed out, they've lost one game in this calendar year, and that was to the to the uh, Raiders earlier this season. So, again, you have those two right now healthy. You don't want really to lose that many games. Um, like I said, this was another uh, instance of that. And I said, uh, valiant effort from the Raiders. Um, it was back and forth all night. Definitely, like I said, if you're an offensive guy like myself, definitely the kind of game you want to see. Um, the teams went back-to-back scores, um, back-to-back touchdowns, the first four possessions of the game. Um, first five possession of the game, actually, because the fifth one, uh, the Raiders scored a, f- kicked the field goal as opposed to scoring a touchdown. Um, like I said, then there were some punts, and then there was interception to end the half, and that was the interception by Mahomes was like kind of bad, but also I think it was a mix up between him and Robinson. Um, Mahomes thought he was going to do one thing, Robinson did another thing, and then you end up throwing to a guy that was come, that was getting up off the ground for an interception. And that was in, the red zone. He was at the 14. So, like I said, they were going up to take the lead heading into half. And, like I said, they throw an interception. So, they weren't able to. And, I mean, not that it really mattered. They got the ball out of half, scored anyway. But then, like I said, the Raiders came back. They scored um, a couple punts. And, like I said, the Chiefs scored to go up. Then the Raiders scored to go up again. Then the Chiefs scored to go up again. And then, obviously, Derek Carr threw the first play interception. But, again, it was they there was, like, what, 20, nine, 20 seconds left? Oh, you're trying to you're trying to you know, make a play down the field. It was a bad pass though. Like he threw it too far inside. The safety was there. Like there's no reason to throw that ball, and especially not throw it there. Tagalar, but yeah, I'm just like you. You're just trying something. It's not really that big of a deal. Um, but yeah, uh, shout out to Derek Carr. He played well outside the interception. He was what he was twenty of thirty before the interception for two hundred seventy five yards, three touchdowns. Obviously the interception. He's twenty three of thirty one with the one interception. Still had a hundred nineteen pass uh, passer rating, ninety five QBR. Aguilar had a good day, 6 for 88 in the touchdown. Waller, 7 for 88 in the touchdown. Jacobs did a little something on the ground still. Um, I mean, obviously, Jacobs has, like, volume and stuff this year. But, like, his yard per carry has to be terrible. He has 3.8, which isn't, like, great. I don't know if that – this is from ESPN, so I don't know if that factors in today's game. But if it, only, if it does, it would only go down. Like I said, like, their their run game is, like, interesting. Like they For a team that, like, runs the ball a lot and it should be pretty good, like, there's a lot of – um, Josh Jacobs runs that don't go for that many yards. Um, and then every once in a while they break one and obviously get some touchdowns here or there. But like I said, for a good running team, they don't really break a whole lot of chunk gains consistently. Again, not that they don't, but I feel like they should do, they should be able to get it more consistently for him. Um, but yeah, like I said, it was just in, and on the chief side, Mahomes 34 for 45, 348, two touchdowns. Like I said, the one interception, um, that Clyde Edwards, he had two touchdowns on the ground. Kelsey had eight for one twenty seven and a touchdown, eleven for one oh two and a touchdown for Tyree Hill. He also decided to do a little razzle dazzle, have um Travis Kelsey do the underhand uh shovel pass that Mahomes tried for a touchdown the other get the other like a couple weeks ago because the Chiefs just try something new in the red zone it seems like every week because I mean when you're in Chiefs, like why not? Um But yeah, like I said, very good, very competitive game. Um like just what would what you'd want from a prime time game. And like I said, it was, it's a shame that the Raiders had to lose because again they played so well. But again, uh, when you're got to when you want to beat the Chiefs, you got to beat the Chiefs. And like I said, they they just left them too much time there at the end. Being of too much time, another game in the NFC had needed extra time to be decided, and that was the Titans and Ravens, another um, very important matchup during the day. Um, in this game, uh, the, like I said, went to overtime. Derrick Henry was able to walk them off. So like I said, uh, Derrick Henry has helped seal two victories in Baltimore in back-to-back season. So I know they weren't happy. I know there was a little chippiness before the game with, like, some Titans players and, like, the Ravens coaches, which is, like, kind of funny. Because normally it's, like, players and players are, like, 
I don't even think like coaches and coaches is really few like that, but for it to be coaches and players and after the game, Harbaugh wouldn't shake Vrabel's hand. Like I said, it was all kind of a bit of a mess. Um, but he knows Harbaugh's are interesting characters. Um, but yeah, uh, the in this game, I gotta give credit to the uh, Titans for for battling back because they were down fourteen ten at half. We're down twenty one ten. In the second half, um, like I said, just they kicked a couple field goals just to keep it close, and obviously got the touchdown uh, there near the end um, to take the lead, and that was the A.J. Brown touchdown, a grown man touchdown, ran through like three tackles from the Ravens on like a slant pass that was clearly short. Like it was third and ten, maybe it was like a five-yard slant. He's getting he's getting tackled. They're going for it on fourth down. Well, no, I'll take that back. They wouldn't have gone for it. No, no, they would have because they were down five at the time. So they would have gone for it on fourth down. Like I said, breaks the first tackle from, like, I think it was Clark. Then, like, Marsha, uh, Marcus Peters. Gets a tackle from him, breaks another tackle. Like I said, runs in, it will get pushed into the end zone by Rick Nichols. But, hey, you know, still scored. Um, so then, so then that, that helped uh, give them the lead. Then uh, Lamar was able to drop them down the field. Nice little two-minute drill to set up a field goal for Justin Tucker. Because, obviously, you know, uh, Justin Tucker was going to make it. No, they, like I said, they got it within the Titans, in within the red zone, but they just weren't able to connect there at the end. Um, we weren't able to get in the end zone, obviously, and then they kicked the field goal. Then um, they, they went three and out to open overtime, then the Titans got the ball, and they didn't give it back. Um, they, you know, put together a nice little drive, and it was capped off, like I said, by a 29-yard run by Derrick Henry to seal it. So this is a rough one for the Ravens only because... Um, with the Browns winning their game against the Eagles, which was, I mean, uh, between the Eagles and uh, Penn State, I should probably just stop watching football for the year. It's really not worth it for me. There's there's no reason to put myself through sort of misery. Plus, like, the Thunder are going to be tanking this year. But at least, like, I know they're going to be bad. So, like, that'll be a lot more fun to watch when you, like, like I said, it's, it's better to watch, like, a team, like, even, like, I'm trying to think. Like, even, like, the Giants, like, this year, like, they're not, they weren't supposed to be good, but, like, because they're competitive and they're in games, you can see improvements. Like, all right, like, that's, that's an enjoyable season. When you're supposed to be better than you are, um, once the season, like, starts. And then, like, you're going through and you're like, why are we so bad? And, like, how are we going to fix this? Like, what's the path to success for this team? That's not nearly as fun. Um, so, like I said, at least the Thunder will give me some, um, hope for the future, because that's really what they're playing for. This year is just, like, the first year of the tank so they could hopefully get like Kate Cunningham or like one of the one of those guys um have to do more research on the draft prospects because you know now that the Thunder are going to be tanking you're going to have to pay more attention um like I said I digress um but yeah so the Ravens need to keep pace because the Browns won um and the Steelers are playing the Jaguars um they it was a little dicey during the first half but they obviously end up pulling away because you know, the Steelers sometimes play down to the competition um but again they just picked off a lot in like four times like it, it, it was what it was. Um, like I said, so this was a big game for them in order to keep pace in the FC North because as of right now, they are currently out of the playoff picture and the Browns are in. So like I said, they're not all in, which is crazy because they smoked the Browns' first game of the season. Um, and it's by virtue of schedules. The Ravens at 6-4 and four are currently out of the playoffs. Like I said, it was an important game for the Titans on the flip side because um, they need to keep pace with the Colts. Obviously, they didn't know the Colts were going to beat the Packers, which they did. Um, but... I said, just, just to be safe, you wanted to make sure you win. So, like, hey, you set up a situation where the game next week is for first place. And it's a really important game for the Titans, seeing as they lost the first one to the Colts. Um, like, much like the Chiefs, uh, Raiders type of matchup again, though obviously the Chiefs had more wiggle room because they, they had a much, they had a better record, um, than, than the Raiders. Like I said, now these two teams are tied. So this is, this game's for first place with five games left. Like I said, the Colts get it. Now they're basically essentially two games up. They will have the tiebreaker. So. Um, and I said not not a must win, but a very important game for the Titans. Like I said, they it was it was a very big game to get for both these teams. Obviously, only one team was going to win. The offs they could have been the tie, but like that doesn't really happen that often. Um, like I said, the Titans were able to come out victorious. Like I said they are seven and three, right there with the Colts. Like I said the Ravens even at six and four are still a good record, um, but unfortunately are on the outside looking in of the playoff picture. If it were to like I said if the playoffs were to start today, um, so that is unfortunate for them. Like I said, the Steelers. Um, kept it, uh, kept it competitive with the Jags for a little bit. Um, at least through the first, first quarter, they were down three nothing after the first, but then they said they got some touchdowns from Claypool and from Benny Stell heading into the half. And then they just, um, well, added on a little bit in fourth. So, as I said, they won 27 to three. 
Um, as I said, it was one situation where Lutton, he just, I mean, Steelers defense, probably the best in the league. There's not really a whole, whole lot you're going to do against them. And I said that four picks. Um, how many times was he sacked? He was only sacked twice, so that's good. Um, but the four picks, not good. Um, so like I said, unfortunate for him. But again, this is Steelers. Kind of, what do you expect? Make a head to, uh, was this Terrell Edmonds or, yeah, Terrell Edmonds had to. Um, like I said, who got the sacks? It was Bud Dupree, Shocker, and Steven Tewitt. So, I said, Steelers did what they had to do. Like I said, kept it competitive for a quarter. Um, cause that's just kind of what they do. Um, but, like I said, got the, got the win in the end, which is what's important. Um, but also look around the, uh, seeing what other games in the AFC. Uh, well, obviously the biggest thing to come out of the AFC, well, one of the biggest things, you could argue, um, was Joe Burrow, done for the year, on a, on a low hit, and against Washington, towards ACL, so very unfortunate for him, uh, due to the fact that, um, he, so I get it, um, but, again, it's a weird situation, because, like, he's still the starter next week, but, like, somehow, um, Ryan Fitzpatrick gave you the best chance to win, and shocker, he turned the ball over there at the end to lose you the game, because that's what Ryan Fitzpatrick does, more times than not, at least. Yes, yeah, so that was a weird one. Um, but yes, yeah, so and now, like I said, you got you got Burrow who's not done for the year, which is unfortunate. Like I said, for the it's unfortunate for the league. It's unfortunate for the Bengals because, like I said, you wanted to see him finish out the year, see how it went. But now, um, he's gone until next year, and like I said, you don't really know how he'll come back from that again. A lot of his mobility in the pocket is obviously based around his leg. So you, you hope that he's not compromised when he comes back next year from this ACL. Um, but again, a lot of like the guys like Deshaun Watson have come back uh, recently and still been as good as they were. Uh, Carson Wentz, a little bit different story. So hopefully you, you hoping he's more Watson than Carson, at least recently, obviously Tom Brady had happened to him. He came back, he was fine. Um, I think Phil, didn't Phil Rose have it a while ago. Like he used, I mean, he's not mobile, but that's the thing. Like, Brady and Bre- and Rivers aren't really mobile guys, but they've come back, had good, good careers. Like I said, Deshaun Watson doesn't look any less mobile than he was before, so that's good. And obviously Joe Burrow could potentially win them a couple games with Ryan Finley in there. Hopefully they lose the games they, not necessarily they want to lose out per se, but if they do, um, like I said, they're going to be behind the Jets and the Jags most likely in terms of draft order. So they'll finish like around three. That like should give them a good opportunity to draft uh, Sewell from Oregon. Help out that offensive line because even, like I said, outside of the injury, like Joe Burrow was kind of running for his life a lot and getting hit a lot. So you kind of want to shore up that offensive line to make sure he stays healthy and make sure he's able to play 16 games. Um, like I said, the, the, this injury is more of a freak injury, but still, he was getting hit too much during the season anyway. So as a fourth, like I said, Tua got benched in his game against the Broncos. Um, like I said, was not playing that well. Um, and that's it. That, that, I mean, I'm not saying it's a bad loss, per se, because, again, this is a game that the the Dolphins should win, but it's on the road. It's in Denver. Like, the um, that's a little bit, that's, again, it's a little different for for teams, like, to travel up there for the first time. If you've never really been up there, obviously. I've never, not that I've been, but just what they talk about with the sports, the altitude and stuff, is it takes some time to get adjusted to. I might say Tua was 11 for 20 for 83 yards and a touchdown. Got sacked six times. So, like, he, like I said, not his best game. Um, Fitzpatrick came and tried to do work his little Fitz magic, but did not work. Um, on the Broncos side, like Drew Locke wasn't really that great, but they ran the ball well. Melvin Gordon had two touchdowns, and like I said, the defense got six sacks, and that all will get the job done um, when when it comes down to it. And like I said, Justin Simmons got the pick there at the end to seal it. And like I said, the last uh, rookie Herbert, I mean, he's continued to play sensational. Was it against the Jets? Yes, but he's been sensational basically. Almost every game this year. I think this is like his fifth game over like 300 yards or something this year. He's another game with multiple touchdowns. He threw three today. 37 to 49, 366, three touchdowns. Like I said, continues to play great. Um, like I said, his record doesn't reflect his level of play, but I'm with Burrow out now. He's probably like the lock for offensive rookie of the year, you would think. Um, but Justin Jefferson's up there too as well. Uh, don't want to don't wanna leave him out. Obviously, there's some other guys that will have a case. But like I said, Justin Herbert, since a lot of these awards are more quarterback friendly, um, if he continues to play at the level of, of, of play that he's at, continue to um, set and potentially break um, rookie passing records and things like that, I mean, it's going to be hard to not give him the award. But again, you still got, you still got the season, you still got six games left. See how it plays out. 
Um, but I said he continued to play great. It was still a competitive game, um, sadly enough for the Chargers, I guess you could say. Um, because, again, the Jets, you're supposed to win that. They were up 31-13 um, in the second half. But the Jets made it made it close. Um, they had a chance there to, to actually tie it if they got a two-point conversion, but they, were, they weren't able to get uh, get a fourth and nine. So, like I said, uh, the Chargers um, actually won a game, didn't trick it off, so shout out to them. And shout out to Justin Herbert because he continues to play well. So that's what you like to see from the young guys. So that's the AFC side of things. When we come back, we'll discuss um, the NFC side of things. There wasn't as many good games, but still a couple interesting um, um, interesting matchups and some, some interesting outcomes. So we'll discuss those right after the break. Stay right there. Are you looking for the very best NFL and college football podcast? Then check out the GSMC Football Podcast. Get the latest football news both on and off the field. From the NFL draft to trades to the rumor mill to the NFL combines. They got you covered. That's gsmcpodcast.com backslash football dash podcast. Get updates on college rivalries, game day insights, and much, much more. It's football talk the way you want it. This show eats, sleeps, and breathes football. Don't forget to like them on Facebook and follow them on Twitter. Visit gsmcpodcast.com for more info. as many interesting matchups in the NFC, but an interesting outcome for an NFC team was the Packers and the Colts, because this was a game that the Packers had won. And I mean, you never, you never can say that for certain, but like they were up 28 to 14 at, at the end of the first half. You're like, Oh, okay. Like, and again, you didn't think they were going to get blown out or anything. You know, the, the Colts never, aren't really like a team since Frank Reich has been there. Just completely give up. So you figured they were going to fight back. Um, but then, like, still, like, the Packers literally didn't score the rest of the game until, like, the field goal at the very end to, like, to tie the game up. Like, that that was the last time they scored between the first half and the second half. Like, it was right before overtime. Um, but, yes, then, like, the, the Colts just meticulously or, or slowly, or I can't think of the right word, but, again, slowly, just fought their way back into the game. I um, got a field goal out of the half to make it twenty eight to seventeen. Then they forced a three and out. Then they got another touchdown. This one was um a pass to Jack Doyle, so now it's twenty eight to twenty five. Then they force another three and out. Then they have another field goal drive. And then they force a fumble on the kick return. And then they get another field goal drive. Then they force a uh turnover on downs. Uh this was the yeah, that was the weird I I I hate. And again, I get it. You can't, you can't be predictable when it tries some of these things. But I hate because they're not the only team to do this. I know the Eagles have done some team, other teams do this. Teams that go like it's third and one or third and two or fourth and one, fourth and two or something like that. And they go under center, like play action. I'm just like, for what? And like I said, they tried to under center play action. Didn't work. He tried to end up floating a pass to Jamal Williams down the left sideline. Couldn't connect on it. Like I said, no one was really open. Like I said, I, I don't. I love the under section under center play action call on short yards downs, especially when you need to get like third down, like maybe, especially if you're gonna go for it on fourth, like all right, but fourth down you like have to get it, especially when at that point you were already down. So this was like a very important drive. This happened it turned over like three minutes left. So you weren't hundred percent certain you were gonna get the ball back at that point. Like I was like you would think in theory you'd call one of, if not your best short yardage play that you have again in the game plan for this week. And I I don't know, maybe that maybe that's what maybe they thought that was their best short yardage play. Obviously it didn't work out. Um but since then they turned it over on downs. They were able to force a punt after eight plays, but yeah, the, 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 this drive was uh, disgusting. Um because the, the, I think there was like there was like a penalty it seemed like four or five straight straight uh 
what's it called, four or five straight uh, plays. Like, yeah, like, I think, like, the the Pacs were jumping off sides, and, like, the the Colts were, like, holding, like, literally every play. Um, at, well, Like I said, at one point, and, okay, so it goes from first and five. Well, it goes from first and ten to, to now somebody jumps off sides. Now it's first and five. Then they have ten guys, then they have too many guys on the field on, on Green Bay. So now it's first and ten again. Then there's a hold. Then it's first and 20. There's another hold that's declined. Then it's second and 20. There's a legal motion that's declined. Then it's third and 19 to get like 15 yard run. But I'm like, that's like what, like five, six straight plays with a penalty from between both teams? It's like it very got very sloppy there at the end. But those 15 yards they picked up on a short pass to Wil- uh, Wilkins were important because now fourth and four comes they, the Colts because they're aggressive. Um, that's who Frank Reich is. They said to go for it. And they, they run a nice little pick play for Naeem Hines, if I remember correctly. Um, runs a nice little slant underneath, uh, catches it for 13 yards. They're able to bleed off more clock eventually. And again, there was more penalties here as well. They got a different, like I said, first and 10 hold, first and 20 incomplete pass. Didn't understand that, but whatever. Um, again, just, just run the clock and just like make them force them to use their timeouts. Not because they only had two left at the time. So just make them use their timeouts. Seems simple enough. You also got a good offensive line. You can run the ball. Then a second and 20. With another hold, that's in four, so now it's second and 30. There, there's a run up the middle, then they have to take a timeout. Then, um, then there's a, then they try to pass again as they complete, then they are forced to punt. Because it's like, it's 39, it's like, it would be in like 56 yard field goal, something like that. Like, that's, that the, you're not giving Aaron Rodgers basically 20 yards to go for a field goal. Like, that's, like, that's stupid. So I get that. They, they punted and then, but it didn't matter because Aaron Rodgers drove down the field anyway. That's what he does. Um, was aided by a long pass to Marquez Valdez scant, scaling d- deep down the middle for 47 yards on third and 10 from the six. I was looking at the situation where it was like, screw it. Might as well give it a shot. And it worked. Um, then they say they were able to drive down, get it within the red zone. Um, weren't able to, to uh, they didn't have enough time and they weren't able to convert. And they, then they said, kick the field goal. Green Bay wins the toss, gets the ball. Um, I think it was the second play. Yeah, second play. After a nice little uh, pass to Aaron Jones, they tried a, a quick little bubble screen to Valdez Scantling. He uh, tries to turn up, fumbles. The Colts pick it up. And like I said, they run a couple plays. Kick a field goal. Boom. Uh, game over. They they count out the dub. Like I said, it was important after the Ravens, after the Raven, after the Titans won, excuse me, to for them to win. So I said, again, we keep pace with them ahead of that matchup next week. Um, but again, also just another note, shout out to Julian Blackman. Uh, again, he, he was, he wasn't going to start this year. Wasn't, I don't know how much he would have played if Malik Hooker didn't get hurt, which I mean, is a story of Malik Hooker, unfortunately, but he's definitely been great this year. He's been, I was probably on the short list. If you were going to name it for a defensive player of the year at this point in time, like again, as a guy that's unhailed, I think it was a, I think I said it was a third round pick. Not really, uh, on a lot of people's radars, uh, has two interceptions on the year, six pass defense. Um, has well, I guess they didn't update the newest force fumble that you just had, but he has he has a force fumble uh, on the season. Uh, like I said, he's been he's just been he's been a very solid, solid piece for the Colts defense as a rookie. Like played a big part. Obviously, they said made the arguably the biggest play of this game. So. Um, like I said, he's been good. Like I said, definitely be on the short list for defensive rookie of the year. Um, when it, whenever, if you were to make it night like today with six games left, we'll see how the rest of the season goes. But he's been very good. Then on the Packers side of thing, again, not a huge loss because the Bears kind of stink. So you're you're pretty much clear in your division currently. But again, in terms of the one seed in the in the NFC, you lost that because the Saints, even with Taysom Hill, got the win. Against the again against the Falcons, but they still got the win. So now they're eight and eight and two. You're seven and three. The Bucks are seven and three. Then the the what's it called? The Seahawks are seven and three. We'll see what happens with the Rams if they get the win. They'll be seven and three though. If they get the win, then obviously most would drive down to seven and four. Um, but yeah, like I said, there's, there's a lot of competition at the top, so you want to try to win as many games as you can. And this was a game that, in theory, the Packers. Had one, I'm not gonna say had one, but had a good chance of winning. And then even like I said, when they got the ball first in overtime, you kind of thought like, "Oh, it's probably it." But unfortunately, that's not what happened. Um, because again, the Colts made a good play. So 
you know, the other team gets paid to. So that's that was a tough one for the Packers, um, but hopefully they'll be able to bounce back, like I said, next week against the Bears in prime time. I believe that's the Sunday night game next week. I want to double check that. Why can't I find the Packers game? Um, hmm. Oh, there it is. Okay, yeah, no, so yeah, no, they play the Bears in prime time. They said they play the Bears, Eagles, Lions, Panthers, Titans, and then Bears again. So, a lot of winnable games, in theory, on their schedule, assuming they can get past the Bears first. So again, divisional matchup, you never know. Um, but Aaron Rodgers has generally had the Bears number over recent years. So, well, I mean, over the course of his career, really, but definitely over recent years. So, you would think that that's, that would continue this season. Um, seeing as the Bears, especially offensively, is are very inept. Um, but you know, maybe what they need is a division opponent to get them right. Like I said, it's not like the the Colts had a whole lot of trouble moving the ball. Like I said, the uh letting look good last week against them. Uh the they were already lost to the Vikings. Like I said, the the uh the Bucks smoked them. Like I said, they were in a very competitive game with the Saints score wise, or even a very competitive game first game of the year with the Vikings score-wise. So, again, it's not the defense hasn't given up some points. Um, but, again, unless the Bears use their – well, like I said, unless the Bears use their buy to, like, again, revamp the offense, if you will, um, you kind of got to expect it's still going to look a little shaky. So, that's unfortunate for them. Um, like I said, good win for the Colts. Tough loss for the Packers, especially – speaking of good win, uh, the Cowboys. And I say it's a great win because the Vikings were 4-5, and five, but they've been playing better. We're, we're, or we had one of the last three games. And this was a big game for them to potentially get back in the playoff race. But in their first game out of the bye, the Cowboys got the dub. Andy Dalton didn't look terrible, which is basically all they needed. Um, especially with the defense not playing great, but improving. Um, only gave up 28 points today. So, you know, definitely an improvement based on the numbers they were putting up to begin the season. Um, but I said Andy Dalton had three touchdowns today, one interception. Um, Zeke had his first 100-yard game of the season, I believe. Um, I'm trying to think Tony Pollard had a touchdown run, 42-yard touchdown run. Amari Cooper had a solid day. C.D. Lamb had one of the best catches you'll see this year on a very poorly thrown like corner route by Andy Dalton. He completely had to adjust, fall back, kind of pulled it in with one hand. It was very, like I said, if you haven't seen it already, I imagine you have if you've been on social media. But if you haven't, Go check it out. Very impressive. Like I said, definitely one of the best catches of this season so far. A lot of the rookies at all positions are kind of showing out. Um, very Especially offensively. It's very interesting that, uh, you know, normally you, you're like, oh, rookies be ready, blah, blah, blah. But like a lot more rookies are coming in and being good and useful earlier in, in their careers. Don't know necessarily why that is. Or maybe it's just this um, product of like more rookies being given opportunities to play. I said even like like even like I was saying with Julian Blackman, like he's playing well. He wasn't expected to be playing this much, but he is, and he's playing well. Like I said, I think a lot of, uh, I think somebody said this. I don't know if it was on Twitter. I was into like a, uh, podcast or something. But um, I think a lot of people were saying that like, the fact that more rookies getting opportunities, you were seeing more rookies, and we're like again, we're kind of shocked that like rookies are playing well so quickly. But the thing is, just the old Foss were just like, hey, you're a rookie. You got to sit. You got to learn. You got to. Uh, understand what it's like to be an NFL player. The game's different than college, blah, blah, blah. And it's definitely true. Like I said, man, not every rookie. You know, they have your ups and your downs. Like I said, Tua was, was talking about how, how easy the transition was, and obviously he's had a struggle with it today. Justin Herbert hasn't had that. Um, but again, you get the point. But again, I just feel like a lot more rookies are being given opportunities earlier. And then because of that, they're playing well. Um, because there's not the talent isn't there. If you're a first-round pick, you should be talented. Um, like I said, a lot of these guys just don't get their, aren't in the right system or aren't given their opportunity to really showcase their skills and things like that. And I feel like more teams are willing to give younger guys a look or like even like a Javon Kinlaw, um, and with the 49ers, he's been very good for them this year. Um, I say guys like that, like just, um, that are given the opportunity, generally speaking, have played well. Like I said, CeeDee Lamb is another example. Also Justin Jefferson on the other side of uh, that. He had what? Three for eighty six and a touchdown. Adam Thielen continues to be uh, very good, um, even though again not as many people are talking about him this year, which is fair because obviously Justin Jefferson's having a great uh, rookie season, but he's having a great year in and of itself at eight for one twenty three and two touchdowns. I'm just again, I think he's he's got to be if he isn't, he's definitely near the top in touchdowns from um, receiving. I think he was 
at nine coming in, if I remember correctly. And so then that would put that would put him at eleven. I want to say, yeah, because the ESPN doesn't have the newest game input; they only have nine games. So yeah, so then he he'd be at eleven for the season. So again, having a very very quiet good year. Well, not very not that quiet because he's played back to back national TV game. On well, not national TV, but um. He played a national TV game on Monday night, and then obviously had another great game against the Cowboys, which a lot of people saw, I would imagine, because it's the Fox game. Um, it wasn't the Fox game of the week, but you get the point. Um, but yeah, it was a good win for the Cowboys just because if they want to try to win this division, then, you know, they got to keep pace. Now every team in the NFC East has three wins because the Eagles think, and, like, the Cowboys, Washington, and the Giants are all improving. So there is that. Um, so like I said, if you're trying to get... And if you're trying to keep pace in division, it's a big win. Plus, if you win against Washington on Thanksgiving, then boom, you're in first place at least for the week, at least heading into the weekend. Because the uh, yeah, because the Giants won't play till Sunday, and then the Eagles play on Monday night. Unfortunately for everybody that has to watch uh, the Eagles in prime time, if you haven't watched the Eagles game, it's going to be disgusting. Imagine against the Seahawks, they can't be they can't be for us to save their lives. Um, it's going to be a mess. Um, but yeah, like I said, if you if the Cowboys have any aspirations of winning the division, which I mean, yeah, you could argue. Uh, winning the division this year probably isn't the best thing because like each of these teams have their flaws and you're probably just asking to get smoked um, by like the Bucks or the Saints or like the Rams or the Cardinals, whoever finished the second or whoever finished in that five seed. But uh, hey, at least you made the playoffs. Um, so there's that. There's some pride to have in that, especially for these other teams that like um, are overcoming things. The Giants would be a big improvement if they win the division. Same with Washington. And the Cowboys will just have overcome all the injuries. The Eagles, on another point, standpoint, like they should win. Um, but like they also are terrible and I would prefer they had a top five pick. So I don't really care if they win the division, but they're going to at least, I think, well, I can't even say they're going to try because they're still playing people that are, have been terrible all year. Like if they were trying to win the division, they would have benched these guys to play somebody else. But I digress. Um, again, just looking around the, just finishing up looking around the NFC. Um, I said Washington got the win over the Bengals. Oh, and then also obviously the Taysom Hill in his first start. Wasn't terrible, didn't do a whole lot, but wasn't terrible. It was very efficient, let me put it that way. It was very efficient. 18 of 23, 233 yards, no touchdowns, but no interceptions. That's important. Had 51 yards on the ground, um, was along with two touchdowns. Um, threw the ball out to Michael Thomas, which I appreciated for my fantasy team. But um, Mahomes and Kelsey did their best to undo all the good that I had done earlier in the day. And so now I'm only up 10 heading into Monday night. Not necessarily a fun time for me. Um, did lose a fumble. Um, but the defense showed up. And like I said, if this is the defense they're going to get with Taysom Hill in there, they're going to be completely fine. If this is the defense they get when Drew Brees is back in there, they're going to be super fine. Um, they got eight sacks on Matt Ryan, um, had 11 quarterback hits, had seven tackles for loss, um, had two picks. Um, so like I said, if they can if they can get after quarterbacks like that over these next few games, they're going to be in good shape. Like if they play the Broncos next week, it's not like that's a – Tough team, and like I said, Drew Locke is, if you get to him, he will throw you the ball sometimes. They play the Falcons again, um, play the Eagles. Like I said, Carson Wentz, same thing, assuming he's still in there. Um, like I said, if you get after him, that he will he will turn the ball over. And it's not like that line is like that great. Like they like what gave up, like, I want to say like five sacks today, something like that, without Miles Garrett, which is embarrassing. But it is just what the Eagles are this year. I think, yeah, I'm pretty sure Carson Wentz is the most sacked quarterback in the league right now, so... Some of that's on him. Some of that's going to be out offensive line. So it'll be interesting to see uh, kind of how that goes. Like I said, their games without Drew Brees. I think the OC comeback is the Eagles game. Like I said, they probably don't even need him for that. Get him healthy for the Chiefs game. That's that's the game you potentially could need him. I don't think you'd be in Patrick Mahomes with Taysom Hill. No offense to Taysom Hill. But like I said, I think you, I think you could beat the Eagles um, with Taysom Hill, especially since they can't really stop running quarterbacks. Um, So there is that. Um, But yeah, like I said, good win for the, good win for the Saints in the first of the Taysom Hill I don't want to say Taysom Hill era, but Taysom Hill starting era. And um, like I said, just they need to keep pace. And now they're in first place in the NFC. And eight and two. Like I said, we'll see what happens with the Bucks on the Bucks on Monday night. And but if they said the Bucks catch that L, now they're two games clear in a division with the with a tiebreaker over them. So like I said, now they're they're basically essentially three games up with six games to play. That you should be in pretty good shape, um, and yeah, I'm pretty sure. Yeah, regardless if they if the Bucks lose, then they're definitely locked in 
to first place. And even if I think of the Bucks win, they're still they would still be locked in the first place in, in the NFC. So good weekend for the Saints outside of you know obviously Drew Brees having eleven fractured ribs. Um, but yeah, there's had a lot going on in the NFL. Um, so not not there to discuss from this NFL Sunday. And um, the NBA is no different. Uh, there was a lot that happened since the draft in terms of signings and trades and that, and all this other stuff. So it'd be too much to discuss every single thing that happened because there's just too much stuff that's happened. It's even, like I said, it's hard to keep up with everything that's been going on. So I will look at some of the playoff teams from last year and see which teams I think potentially improved the most or maybe take a step back. Um, but yeah, so we discussed those right after the break. Stay right there. Check out the show that's built on the MMA. From the UFC to extreme cage fighting, they got the fights covered. Check out the GSMC MMA podcast. Get the latest news on past or upcoming fights. Join us as we talk to and about some of the biggest names in the MMA, past, present, and future. When it's the fight game, there's just one show to check out. GSMCpodcast.com backslash MMA dash podcast. Don't forget to like them on Facebook and follow them on Twitter. Visit G. GSMCpodcast.com for more info. Like we talked about before the break, I've been very eventful. A lot of stuff has happened. A lot of stuff has transpired uh, over the weekend um, in terms of trades and signings and acquisitions and things of that nature. And like I said, that's, that and that didn't even include the draft that happened. I know. I guess I think I said Thursday, but it was like Wednesday. Um, but but still, like I said, a lot of a lot of moves have been made. A lot of teams have reshuffled their roster. A lot of teams will continue to reshuffle their roster over the next week. Two weeks heading into training camps to start of I guess well actually no. I take that back, not two weeks. It's literally they literally have about a week. Because a week from Tuesday, um, is December first, and that's when everybody's supposed to like, you know, get get started back up to uh begin a new season. Um, December, like I said, twenty second, I believe, is the first day. Um, like I said, right around Christmas, so twenty second is a Friday. No, it's January. Twenty second is a Tuesday. Christmas is on a Friday. Huh. That's fun. Um, not that it matters. But, no, yeah, that's cool. But yeah, so, I said, with all the moves being made and all the, like I said, all the different things being done, I still feel like, as hard as it is to imagine, like, I don't think this happens that often. Um, but I feel like you could make a very, very valid argument that the defending champs got better. Now, again, we'll have to see how it plays out on the court. And some of the guys that got are a little bit older. See if they'll stay healthy or be able to stay healthy throughout the season and into the playoffs. But I do believe that you could argue that the defending champs got better. Obviously, they acquired uh, Wesley Matthews. I believe they did that. Uh, when did they, that's a good point. When did they acquire Wesley Matthews? Uh, I don't. I believe that was a little bit. Was that around? The, I feel like that was around the draft time, if I remember correctly. Uh, that was one of the earlier moves that they made. I'm trying to look up the exact date of this. I believe that was one of the earlier moves they made. Uh, well, obviously, well, okay, so they signed him. This was on Friday? Friday. Yeah, so obviously the earliest move they made was trading for Dennis Schroeder. Obviously, that's the earliest move. But yeah, but Friday was right around, uh, I think that was right, but that was sometime after when uh, a free agency started, obviously. So like they added Wesley Matthews again. They already traded uh, uh, Danny Green. So like, already right, you need to get somebody back. And um, well, Danny Green again, a very solid player. Um, he definitely was inconsistent, especially in the bubble um, and throughout the playoffs. 
But again, the bubble's weird. You never know. But I mean, this is, this is no different than what he was uh, last year. He was inconsistent. I would not last year, two years ago. He was inconsistent with the Raptors as well throughout the playoffs. Like sometimes he was, he was hitting his three, sometimes he wasn't. Um, a little bit better defensively, but it's still very inconsistent. Um, now they bring in Wesley Matthews, who shot 36% from three last year. Um, so again, still a fine shooter. He's a 38% three point shooter over the course of his career. So again, assuming that percentages hold, um, he'll still be very good. Um, and, and he was one of the better defenders in the league, which I feel like is definitely a key because of not only losing Danny Green, you lost Avery Bradley as well, along with Rondo. So again, you got to kind of make up some of that wing defense over the course of the season. Um, and I think Wesley Matthews is a guy that could really slide right into that role, and like I said, seamlessly. And you could argue, do it better, if not as good, then better than Danny Green did it. Now, like I said, for the season, Danny Green shot, okay, about the same from three. And it's like I said, if you can shoot that 36, 37% from three, at least plus play a little bit better defense than Danny Green. I don't think he was bad defensively, but... Again, Wesley Matthews was very good defensively last last year, especially in like isolation and one on one things like that. Um, he was very good. So like I said that can that can hold up. Then like I said, you replace Danny Green with uh, Wesley Matthews. That's definitely not a bad trade off in my opinion. And like I said, that's not that's not all. Obviously, I did a shoulder. Also, um, they lost to White, which is um, big in my opinion because of the fact that he was very good for them off the bench. And kind of starting in the playoffs, especially in the bubble, like against guys like Jokic, because like you have to, there's a center you got to match up with, which we'll get to how they filled that role um, in a second. But they brought in Montrezl Harrell, who, um, obviously, given the given the the move the Clippers made, you probably would, would want to bring in Serge, but they couldn't. Um, but they brought in Montrezl Harrell, and while he may or may not be played off the floor in the playoffs, at least during the regular season, he will be able to provide a lot of points and a lot of scoring and a lot of energy um, to that second unit and him and Dennis. Again, they go on the same chemistry, at least in the beginning, that him and Lou Will had, but eventually they should be able to get it going. And that, that should be a nice scoring tandem off the bench. They were one and two in six man of the year voting. So now I said, uh, much like, again, the Clippers, you talk about their bench um, and him and Lou Will. Now, again, you get him and Dennis, who, I mean, Dennis isn't Lou Will, at least in terms of a shooter, but he's younger, he's faster, he's quicker. Things like that. So again, their second unit is is improved because that was a, that was really a big issue for them is that they didn't really have a whole lot of scoring coming off their bench outside of like Kuzma, kind of. Um, but I said now you got two legitimate double digit fifteen plus point per game scores off your bench um, when you need them. And like I said, Dennis, we've seen he can have twenty thirty point games. Montrez can have like a twenty point game. And like I said, these are these are two of the better six men in the league. So like I said, that helps bolster your bench. You brought back KCP, so you didn't lose him. Um, that's good. Again, he he earned it. He struggled to begin the year. He was, he was also a little bit shaky the year before, but during the playoffs and in the bubble, he he more than earned his role, hit big shots, played good defense, things like that. And then you brought him back, didn't lose him. Um, you I guess you still have Guzma, if you care about that. Still got Caruso. Um, and then you went out, and then today, today being Sunday, they signed uh, Marcus Saul. Um, guys said they weren't able to get a Baca and they needed a, another center and they traded McGee. I mean, not that they needed to have McGee around, but like I said, they bring in Marcus Hall. And while he wasn't that good, in my opinion, like I said, he looked a bit older, looked a little bit slower this last year in, um, in Toronto, especially, um, in the playoffs, he's still a solid defensive player, still, uh, again, a good, a good, uh, a good enough passer. Um, still can space the floor a little bit. He shot 38% from three during the season. Obviously, during the playoffs, it really wasn't like that. He was not really that good offensively. But he at least spaces the floor. Like I said, with Dwight in there and with JaVale in there, with AD, like it just, it claws up the paint because um, they got to they gotta stay down. They got to stay down by the block because they don't have no offensive game outside of the paint. Um, at least Marcus Saul, he can still be down the paint, but he can extend out to three. Like I said, it's going to open up the floor for AD, open up the floor for LeBron, um, Dennis, when he's in on um, those type of guys, like I said, to be able to attack and able to do different things that they weren't able to do with other than when Anthony Davis was at the five. Like I said, you can play Anthony Davis at the four if you want to. Um, and like I said, still have the spacing that you would like. So like I said, that's that's going to be 
um, good for them. Like I said, on top of the having Wesley Matthews and other guys out there as shooters. Um, so like I said, that that's good. So like I said, it's very very rare that a defender champ can change their ro- change their roster and improve. But I think there's a legitimate case to be made that the uh, the Lakers did in fact improve. Um, over the, like I said, the Reeve being off season, that's even with losing, like I said, lost Rondo, lost uh, Dwight, lost Avery Bradley. And with the guys they were able to bring in, like I said, you could make a legitimate case that they were able to, they were able to uh, not just stay in pat, but also like improve to kind of separate themselves in in the league. Like I said, you no one really knows until obviously the, the games are played and things like that. But as I said, at least on paper, it's looking pretty all right for them. So, um, that's nice for the Lakers on top of that. Just another, looking around another playoff team. Obviously, we talked about the Clippers. Um, they, they lost Montrez. That hurt. But you bring in Ibaka, and I feel like he's a perfect fit for them in terms of what they could use. Obviously, you still could have Zubach out there. He, he can still get the start. And he probably should start. He was better than Montrez. Um, in the bubble. Like I said, not saying for the whole season, but in the bubble, he was better than Montrez. Um, probably were, were better off they played him more um, because the Montrez minutes were um, basically a net negative um, throughout the playoffs. But I said you have him. Um, and like I said, you, he, he's a guy that can space the floor. I think he shot level like 30. I think I was reading he shot like 38, 39% from three last year. Obviously, he's known as a shot blocker. And he wasn't really that last year. I guess not his moments, but he's not really the, the defensive stalwart that he was um, back in his OKC days. But he's also a much improved shooter from Zoki C days. Again, he was more of a pick and pop, like mid range kind of guy that was his shot, but now he can do that same type of thing, but also extend it out to the three. So in the space to four, a little bit better. This is something Montrez couldn't do. Like I said, he's not going to score 16, 17 points a night. Like Montrez did. I think well, Montrez averaged like 18, I believe. So the, he's not going to do that either. But like I said, in terms of spacing, in terms of shooting, in terms of defense, like that, those are things that, you could use, and again, he's still going to be able to match up with some of the some of the bigger um, guys. Still be able to match up, match up with like a Jokic. Still be able to match up with, uh, and I mean, not not like stop them or anything, but like match up with a Jokic, match up with Anthony Davis in terms of the fact that he won't get played off the floor. Like I said Montrezl Harrell got played off the floor by Jokic in the playoffs against the Nuggets. Like I said that that shouldn't happen to Serge uh, during the, during this season. Again, well, you never know. Um, you know, I guess we'll have to, you have to see what happens to go from there. But like I said, that, that was a big one, in my opinion, for them to be able to get, um, to be able to get Surge after losing Harrell. And so it's still not that old, only 31. So again, good, uh, I forget if he, I think he's had a two year deal, if I remember correctly. Um, but yeah, that, that was a big get for them. And it will be an interesting one to bring in also again, looking around, kind of to focus on the playoff teams for now. Um, the Nuggets are an interesting one only because of the fact that I feel like the loss of Jeremy Grant is going to hurt them. Um, again, he was very good for them in the bubble. And any of that, that's what we're going to be saying a lot of that in these things. But, oh, this person was good in the bubble. This person was bad in the bubble. So you have to see how it translates to non-bubble play. And he was very good in the bubble um, in terms of scoring, defense, matching up against guys like LeBron, or Anthony Davis, whoever. Like That's going to be something that they're going to miss. Uh, next year, unless they got three years, sixty million, like the Nuggets can really afford to pay that. So there is that. Um, and and obviously he's definitely expanded his game since since he started with the Sixers, but traded to OKC. He's he's grown as a player, and then obviously with the Nuggets, um, he's continued to continued with that growth. So see what happens when he's in Detroit. But like I said, that's a uh, interesting and kind of a big uh, low key big loss between. Um, for the Nuggets, just because like that's a good portion of the defense that is now gone. Like he, he's gone. Um, I believe they rescinded their qualifying offer, or whatever, on Terry Craig. So like he's going to be gone. Um, so I yeah, that's a good portion of the defense that's now not going to be there. Again, they were able to re-sign Paul Millsap. Um, you obviously hope for improvement from Michael Porter Jr. Especially on the defensive end. Um, so like I said, you don't. You, you you they're not gonna like completely fall off the the table. Plus they got a trade exception from the Jamie Grant deal. Hopefully they can use that um a little bit. Um they also lost Mason Promley, but he I mean he wasn't really like that, in my opinion. Um so that's not that bad. Now Braun under Michael Green, 
to help kind of mitigate the loss of Jeremy Grant for obviously a lot of much cheaper cost. Uh, two years, only $15 million. And like I said, we're also brought by Paul Mills up. So again, they still have some, still have some piece, I imagine. Uh, Mills up will be off the bench. Jim Michael Green will be off the bench. OG, I would think they're going to start Michael Porter Jr. next year, right? Like you would think, like again, he's still doing the defense, but like you would think they're not going to start Paul Mills up again. But again, we'll see what happens. Um, but like I said, the defense is going to be a little, I mean, not that it was like lockdown, but like I said, losing Grant and Craig was the two of your better defenders. You're going to have to figure out how to, you're going to make that up. Um, but again, bringing the Michael Green will help in that regard. I'm trying to think. I'm trying to go. Well, the Blazers were another team. They definitely made some improvements, obviously, before um, they traded. Um, well, I guess well, I think it was before the draft or like right around the draft. They traded for um, they traded for Covington. I forgot, I forgot his name for a second. Yeah, they traded for Covington, which is obviously big because they needed somebody on the wing that could really d somebody up. Um, brought back Ronnie Hood, who was good for them, obviously, before the Achilles situation happened. Um, brought back uh, Carmelo, who, again, he's still going to be a little bit older, but, again, as a, he was good for them last year. The least he could do was, like, be a vet presence on the on the, on the the bench. Like, that's not a bad thing. That's not a bad role for Melo. Again, every once in a while, he could have himself a good game, but, again, he's not going to be counted on the same way he was counted on this year, you would think, assuming people stay healthy. Also brought back, uh, I'm brought back, uh, Canner in a trade who was good for them. I guess what was that two years ago? I want to say not as a backup big for Nurkic. And then now it's a need guy for you. Yeah, because Whiteside's a free agent. I'm pretty sure. So they need to like again find a way to um replace him. Canner's a solid option. Knows the team. Been around the team. Understands the offense. Understands his role. What his role will be. Things like that. So like I said, I think that's a good one. So. Um, like I said, between Covington, getting getting Hood back, getting, like I said, bringing Melo back, getting Cantor. They also signed Derek Jones Jr. I mean, nothing too crazy, but again, he's at least, at least he's a very good athlete. Uh, every team could use that to some degree. So like I said, they they definitely, um, obviously Covington's the big get, but like if they improvements out of Gary Trent and um, Anthony Simmons and Zach, and like Zach Collins stays healthy, like again, they... they they have something to build off of, um, in terms of like like where they finish this year and like what they could become or what they could be next year, assuming everyone's gonna be healthy. I think that's gonna be the big story with them is just like can they stay healthy? That's really um that was the that was their big issue. Um, even to end the season. Um, on top of the fact that throughout the entire regular season just like health. So again, if they can get guys back and healthy, um they they could definitely make a play for a higher uh seed. In the NBA, I don't know me personally. So I said, going on to the East side of things, um, obviously the the Nets aren't. Well, no, technically the Nets didn't make the playoffs. Um, but yeah, their their big get was bringing back Joe Harris. Obviously, they couldn't sign Surd. I know they were looking to sign Surd, but they brought back Joe Harris, which, to my in my opinion, was a very important move just because again, you need somebody to space the floor um, with KD and and Kyrie out there, and you need a guy that when they get doubled or when they're or when someone's pressuring them to get the ball, you need a guy that you can swing into that can knock down open shots. So like I said, that's if you have that in Joe Harris, you can't just leave him open. So that's gonna that's gonna make it easier for a KD and Kyrie to do their thing because again, you can't just you can't just. I mean, you, you're gonna help off of them sometimes, but again, you you generally wouldn't want to leave Joe Harris because that that's a knockdown shooter right there. Um, so like I said, bringing him back was important in my opinion. Helped helped them out. Or will continue to help them out immensely. Plus, they were able to also get Jeff Green. That's more of a little underrated signing. Um, but getting Jeff Green, I feel like, is good just as a backup big. Somebody with some size. Obviously, he was the small ball five um, with D'Antoni and the Rockets last year. So, could play the four and the five position. Uh, that'll be big. And that'll be helpful, in my personal opinion. Um, let's see what else. Um, the Rockets um, brought in Christian Wood, who was very good for the Pistons last year. Um I think I got a nice little bag, three years, $41 million. And he could be like the little small ball um, center. If that's what they want to do, don't know what their offense is going to be like, assuming Russ and Harden are still there to start the season. But average 13 points, uh, 16, I mean, six rebounds, excuse me, last year. Um, was the, working on his game, working on a shot a little bit from being, I think it was undrafted originally. So like I said, um, could be that um, Jeff Green type guy, but as a starter, I would imagine, because now that Covington's gone. Um, I don't know exactly what their lineup's going to be, but again, he's you don't pay that big money. I would think to hit the bench. So is that 
And also, obviously, the Raptors lost some people, but they were able to sign back Fred Van Vliet, which, again, is an interesting one because according to, like, NBA.com, the his – or no, I don't think it was according to NBA.com. It was, I was reading an article, and it said that, like, the second year of his deal goes, like, it dips, which is obviously the 2021 the year, which is the year that – is the year – would be the first year of, like, um, a contract for, like, Giannis, per se. So then they're still trying to leave the leave some wiggle room open. Um, in case, you know, they are able to sign him, they, they, they did have Ben Leeds a contract dip a little bit so they could, they could afford, um, to bring him in, which is an interesting, um, thing to say the least. Um, but yeah, no, like I said, not, not for him to get the big payday, the most money ever paid out to a undrafted free agent four years, $85 million. Um, again, there were some people like you thought maybe you go to New York or you can go to Dallas or like Atlanta or something like that, but he back in Toronto. So again, they're not going to completely um, re rebuild the thing. Though he's still kind of young, and Lowry's kind of old. So like maybe once Lowry goes, I forget how many years he has left on his contract. It might just be this last year. But um, you turn the keys over to Van Vliet and Siakam and OG and potentially Giannis, and then go from there. Like I said, we'll see kind of how that goes. But shout out to Van Vliet for securing the bag because, like I said, he got he got a hefty he got a hefty one. Um, but yeah, just like I said, those were some of the bigger moves from the actual playoff teams. Um, then after we come back, and again, that's obviously not everything that happened. Just wanted to touch on some of the, some of the moves that I liked uh, that some of the playoff teams made, or some, like I said, some of the subtractions that they had. Obviously, in the in the sake of Denver, in the case of Denver, obviously they they lost um, a big piece in my opinion. And again, I still think they'll be all right. But again, Jeremy Grant, I think it was a big part of their team and part of their success last year, so that won't be easy to make up. Um, but like I said, some of the, some of the moves from the playoff caliber teams that, that were made. And now after his next, after his next break, excuse me, we'll go into and talk about some of the non-playoff teams, like the Hawks, they made some moves. We'll continue to make some moves depending on, uh, what Donovich and if that offer sheet is matched. You got the Hornets, obviously with the, um, with the head scratcher of the weekend, head scratcher of free agency so far. And when the money they gave out and subsequent player, they had to wave to in order to make the cap space work. Um, you got them, you got the Suns, obviously they're continuing to make moves, continue to add to their team. So we discussed those right after the break. Stay right there. Are you looking for help for your fantasy football team? Check out the GSMC Fantasy Football Podcast. Get today's best advice on who to start, who to sit, even who you should draft. From sleeper picks to red hot lineups, they got it all covered for you. That's gsmcpodcast.com backslash fantasy-football-podcast. We'll cover traditional leagues, dynasty, PPR, even IDP leagues. When you need fantasy help, there's just one show to hit up. Don't forget to like them on Facebook and follow Follow them on Twitter. Visit gsmcpodcast.com for more info. I mean, it's wild. It would have been wild no matter who you gave it, who gave it to him. It would have been wild if it was like twenty five million. It, I mean, twenty five million a year it would have been wild if it was like twenty seven million a year, twenty eight. But no, apparently the Hornets just got money, and well, Michael Jordan clearly was not hurt during the pandemic, and um, he's got money to burn. It just just money he was willing to spend. And he's like, you know what, Gordon Hayward, that's the one I want. Um, now again, you can read a lot of articles about how like it's this and it's that and it's terrible, blah blah blah. We won't know until he actually plays a game. But I will say that in when in 2017, it's not a four year, 128 million dollar deal, so a little bit less. Um, they well a little bit more than what he signed for this time. But at the time, he was a 27 year old. I think he was just off his first All Star appearance. Um, and he hadn't really been injured at any point in time. And since then, in the last three years, he has missed 111 regular season games and 31 playoff games. Um, his per game numbers have dropped 
Uh, which, I mean, makes sense because you got Tatum, Brown. They obviously had a Kemba this year. Like, they played with Kyrie a little bit. Like, like again, there was a lot of mouths to feed in Boston. The numbers still dropped. Um, his efficiency also dropped. His uh, true shooting percentage last year was 59.5%. The, the same as he posted in his final year in Utah. So it's not like he gotten better. Again, he hasn't gotten drastically worse. But he hasn't gotten better. Um, he was also three years older. He was 27 at the time. He's now 30. Like I said, that's to add in the uh, the injury history that he has. Um, so, yeah. So, so four years, $120 million. A little wild, not going to lie to you. But... It gets a little bit even more wild when you factor in the fact that they had to stretch and waive Nick Batum's contract. I think it's his $27 million. So over the next three years, they'll be paying him $9 million. So in effect, they'll be paying... Because again, they have to stretch this in order to sign Gordon Hayward. So in effect, they'll be paying Gordon Hayward almost $40 million over the next three seasons. Which, I mean, obviously is not worth that. Like, obviously. Like, that's absurd. Now, again, maybe you wanted a little... I mean, because I like I'm trying to I'm I've, I've really been trying to figure out the justification for for why like not not that Michael Jordan or or who was it Mitch Kupchak I think that's their GM I could be wrong um, but like I said you don't need to justify it to me why you wanted to do this um, like I said it's 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 your decision it's your prerogative uh, it's not my money I could I could care less what teams decide to do with their what what teams decide to do with their money. But still, at the same time, it's it's like it's like I don't like why. Like I said, this is the player you needed to pair Lamelo Ball with. Again, you just you just drafted maybe the future of your franchise. You made a very universally beloved. I mean, not universally, but um, at least everybody's like these were you got the third one of the three best players, at least originally in the draft. And then maybe well he'd be the one of the three best players. In five years, when you look back at this draft, maybe, maybe not. But again, coming to draft, you got one of the three best players. Which usually never a bad thing. So again, boom, you're a future. Maybe it's looking up. Um, obviously, we're going to be able to get out of the because he's not going to opt out of that kind of money. So there's that. Um, but again, all right. So then, you know, you gotta, you're got you trying to figure out what kind of pieces fit around him. And I get from like a basketball standpoint, like, oh, okay. Gordon Hayward is a wing. He can handle the ball. Be like a secondary ball handler. He can score a little bit. Um, obviously, we'll take some of the pressure off of LaMelo early on. Because, like I said, you don't want to just put everything on his shoulders and be like, hey, guy, carry us. I mean, he's still average. Like, he's he even um, in the injury depleted year, he still averaged 17 and a half points, um, 6.7 rebounds, 4 assists, uh, shot um, 38% from 3, 50% from the field. So, like I said, it's not like he was bad um, last year at all. Again, he just, like, his, his role... Was like his his secondary role is more off the bench, I sometimes close with them. But again, with with Kemba and Smart improving and Tatum and Brown playing, like you're, there's only so many wing minutes you have to go around. Um, so again, he was kind of he was going to get phased out, or not phased out per se, but just phased out of like a major role. Like he's still going to be a part of the team and obviously be important, but he's still going to phase out a major role. So cool, he opts out again. Also, again, apparently. Like, Indiana wanted him, and, like, the Knicks wanted him, but um, I think some reports, like, clearly they weren't going to, I mean, clearly they weren't offering that kind of money. That That's clear as day. Um, but I think the Knicks won, like, a shorter-term deal, because, again, he's been injured. You want to make sure he's healthy. That seems reasonable. Um, but, again, that's just me. Um, but, yeah, it's just, it's just a very peculiar decision, to say the least. Again, Gordon Hayward, is he a bad player? No. But, again, multiple 100... 20 plus million dollar deals for a guy that has one all star appearance. Kind of wild. Like I said, the first one, you with the Celtics. All right, cool. That makes sense because he's coming off his first all star appearance. Like I said, he was, had a clean bill of health. He's getting, he's looking back up his college coach. Like, all right, cool. You justify it. In, in theory, at least. But this one, after he missed all these games, and like I said, he, he was, he, he, he played literally five minutes his first year in Boston. His next year, he was coming back from the injury. He was not that good. Um, you now after like trying to like trying to get back into his rhythm, things like that. And then this past year, he w- he was solid, um, but he still missed a lot of games. Still missed a lot of games in regular season and in the playoffs. Um, so then, like I said, there it's just one of those situations where like I say he started during the season, but then like once you get to his 
the playoffs. Like he he only he only started one game. Well, he only played in five. Um, but he only started in one of them. His averages in the playoffs were off significantly down. His shooting was significantly down. So again, he's not he he's not he had a Jeremy Grant where he was like coming off of a really good playoff, a really good bubble. Like that's not what he had. Like he was actually bad in the bubble compared to what he was there in the regular season. Um, so again, it's just like why this much money? Now that's really all it is. Like again, if you want to sign Gordon Hayward, fine, be my guest. Like people thought he would go to Indiana. Like I said, maybe the Knicks could use him. Like again. I'm not going to get mad at you for one to sign Gordon here. He's not a bad player. But, like, why for this much? Like, there's nothing better you could have spent that money on. And then, like I said, on top of that, you then have to waive Batum. So you're adding in an extra $9 million to his deal. It's like, eventually, you're, you're in, in essence, you're paying him $147 million over four years. Like, like what like what are we doing? Like, like this, I mean, there, there's some bad contracts in the NBA. Believe you me. But this, like, again, we haven't even played a game yet. This might be one of the worst contracts in the league right now. I mean, we talking about the John Wall. You talking about Russell Westbrook. You talking about um, who else? The Mike Conley deal that was signed before. You talking about Tobias Harris potentially, Al Horford. Like, there's a lot of bad contracts in the NBA. This might be the worst, and it hasn't even started. Just, that's that's I'm not gonna I'm not gonna knock it too too much because it can't be the worst. Because again, if he plays well. And Charlotte, then hey, look, it's all worth the money. But he's gonna have to play really well for it to be worth this kind of money. For darn near forty million a year, he, y'all, y'all, you better make the playoffs year one. Um, but yeah, so uh, that was definitely one non-playoff team that uh, surprised me a little bit with uh, some of um, with their um, with with their moves. Like let's just put it that way. You <laughs> with with the moves that they or with the move that they made, obviously. Uh, Gordon Hayward being the main one that was a uh, definitely the wild to your boy. Um, again, Gordon Hayward's not a bad player, but he's just not worth forty million a year. That much I can promise you. Um, but if we're going to look at some people that are giving out money, I mean, that should be somewhat useful. You got the Hawks. The for a non playoff team, you got you got the Hawks, and then we'll talk about the the one more team in a, in a minute. But um, the Hawks were able to acquire. The services of Rajon Rondo to be the backup point guard, and you know play a little defense um, for the for the for the Hawks. That'll be nice to go go alongside Trey Young. They were also able, and not not for too much, only two years, fifteen million. Um, I think is is was that the official deal? I'm trying to find it. I'll have to look it up. How about the official numbers were for Rondo? But like I said, that's that's a deal. It was very useful, very important to the Lakers. Championship run. Yeah, so it says two year deal. Um for yeah, two year deal, fifteen million. Okay, I was right. Um but yes, he was very important and very integral to the to the Lakers playoff and championship run. Um now he's not really the greatest regular season player. Like in terms of, like he doesn't really give that effort all the time, it seems like. He's much more focused on postseason and obviously the Hawks got a long way to go to get there. Um they they weren't really that close this year. And so again, obviously, um we'll see what happens from there, but Again, once again, so the playoffs would be fine, but it, it, but this team's gonna need a, a little bit of service during the regular season. Like this isn't the Lakers. Um, you you need they're gonna need to get some wins in order to even get that far. But again, we'll see how that goes. See how we can help with Trey Young also to go on with the defense side of things. They signed Chris Dunn, who, um, obviously it will, will wore out his welcome in Chicago. But if there's one thing he can do, it is play some defense. So that'll be nice again, just to add to some of the defense. Um, for the for the Hawks, was, like I said, they 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 could use some help on that end of the floor. A two years, ten million dollar deal, nothing too crazy. Um, obviously they signed Gallo, Danilo Gallinari, three years, sixty one point five million dollar deal. So that's a little bit more on the flip side. That's a little bit more offensively driven. Um, and I was kind of curious to how he's going to work because um, John Collins is still there. So you'd think he'd be playing a four, um, but obviously John Collins plays a four. So don't know what the what the thought process was there, but. I mean, he's a guy that can, you guys can stress the floor for you. Guy can hit, knock down threes, can score in the one on one, score in the post. Like I said, he he can he can do a lot of different things offensively for you. So again, that definitely opens up the offense a little bit, opens up the floor a little bit. Him and him and Trey Young in a pick and pop could be pretty interesting. Um, if that's how they want to utilize him, don't know how they can utilize him. Um, I'm not a coach, but like I said, in um, 
in terms of offense, we've had will help a great deal. And also now they're trying to sign Mo Donovich. Will they sign him to an offer sheet? Then the Kings have to match it. And we'll see if they will, see if they won't. Um, but that's another interesting one. Again, another offensively driven signing. Um, 28 years old, so not, not too old. Not four years, $72 million. Again, they got some money to burn. Um, but it'll just be interesting because, again, they they drafted Kevin Herter. They drafted Cam Reddish. Drafted DeAndre Hunter. So they got a lot of wings. And then, like I said, they signed Chris Dunn. They signed Rondo. Like, they got a lot of – I'm not a lot of wings. They got a lot of guards, wings. Um, so I'm kind of curious to see where they go from here with – like I said, with – um with uh, – with Wadonovich, assuming that they have him on the team. Nice there's no guarantee of that. Um, but I am kind of curious to see what they do there just because they, they drafted a lot of guys over the last couple seasons to potentially fit in with that. So, and again, we'll kind of see how that goes um, with the Hawks. But again, at least they're at least they're trying to get more competitive, which is what you like to see. I said they weren't that good last year, and um, obviously I don't think they want to be bad forever. So this this is a step in that direction to, hey, um, we realize the East is not that good at the bottom. Like I said, the Nets are going to be better. So you got probably about seven teams that are locked into the playoffs right now. But the other three teams, I mean, well, the eight seed is definitely up for grabs. Like the Magic aren't that good to the point where you're like, oh, we can't catch them. Um, like I said, you're not, you, you, don't, you don't believe that. Like the Hornets... Yeah, like I said, uh, the Knicks, mm. uh, the Pistons, like maybe if like Blake's healthy, but you never know. The Cavs, uh, maybe uh, Wizards obviously should be better. So they, they um, you would think they signed Bertans back. They got John Wall healthy, even though apparently he wants out. So we'll see how that goes. Um, with that, like I said, they could at least they should be at least competing for the eighth seed in the in the East. Like I said, don't get no guarantee they will. Um, but they they should be. Competing at least for the AC to where they should should be a fight. Also, the obviously the Bulls should be a little bit more competitive. Guys can stay healthy, things like that. Um, and then, like I said, they, they they should be competing for that AC. In my personal opinion, now I'm saying we'll see what happens. They should be competing for the AC. Um, now I guess like I said, the Suns uh, they they made some additions. Obviously, they big one um, adding Chris Paul, but they got another very solid addition in my opinion. Um, signed Jay Crowder was able to take him away from the Heat, which was a little bit of a surprise to myself. But hey, look, they yeah, clearly people like what the Suns are building. So they got him running three year, uh, thirty million dollar deal, ten million dollars a year is kind of a lot. But um, again, he's a nice, solid, solid vet. Again, because now that there are more playoffs, I mean, well, they have playoff aspirations with Chris Paul. They're going to need to sign some of these uh, vet guys because you can't just have a bunch of whole team full of young guys. You're going to need some guys with some experience that are battle tested, things like that. Now, so Jay Crowder is with just in the finals. Um, very solid 3 and D guy. You knock down shots and play a little defense. And you're going to need that over in the West. A lot of, you know, a lot of good, uh, you know, somebody's got to guard LeBron and things like that. And somebody's got to Kawhi, PG. Like, they, they, there's some good wing drafts to try to defend um, in the West. And Jay Crowder could at least help with that. Again, he's not necessarily like a lockdown defender or anything like that. But he's definitely good, definitely good body to throw around. Plus, so he can knock down the threes. Um, so again, that, that's another good one, in my opinion, um, good move that was made personally to, to bring him in there. And then also, again, this is a trade and I mean, this trade was very expansive. Um, the, the Drew Holiday, Stephen Adams trade, kind of how that all went down, but the Pelicans added Stephen Adams, which I think will bolster their 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 defense obviously will bolster their paint presence, and um, like I said, does it just give them a big body down low that so you don't have to rely on Zion all the time to play the five, um, things like that, and again, just another another guy that's a more of a vet, um, like I said, battle tested, hasn't been to like the finals or anything, but um, he's been around for a while, he's uh, he's seen a lot of things, uh, played played in some. Some big, big, big series. Also, um, also, well, they they lost uh, Derek Favor, so again, they needed to find a way to kind of help replace him. And I think Stephen Adams could replace that. And like I said, then just like the paint press between him and Zion should make it a little bit more difficult. Now, Stephen Adams not necessarily a great defender. Having watched a lot of Stephen Adams, like one on one in the post, 
Not, not, not necessarily his thing. Jokic used to work him. Marcus Aldridge used to have career damn days every time. Um, Stephen Evans lined up against him. So again, not necessarily the lockdown, but again, can grab a lot of rebounds. I'm um, gonna set very good screens. So I mean, him and Lonzo could be a nice little pick and roll uh, pairing. He's always been, like good with pick and roll with Russ. Good with pick and roll with Chris Paul. So like I said, that that should continue on if Lonzo, you know, continues to take that next step. Um, but it's like good set good screens for guys like guys like Ingram. It was like that. So again, I'm just in, again just as a very solid presence. I mean, plus he's a guy nice guy to be around. So like I said, there were a lot of moves to be made. I know I didn't touch on every single one of them, or not a lot of moves to be made. A lot of moves that were made this weekend. Didn't touch on all of them. Just touched on some ones I thought were pretty interesting to myself, and um, thought would be interesting to you guys as well. Like I said, there'll still be more moves and more um, additions and subtractions potentially made to teams, trades, things like that signings like I said and as they come in we'll talk about them more but again there was just a massive influx of <laughs> transactions this weekend um like I said if you it's 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 hard to keep track of uh well mainly just as a because I'm a Thunder fan it's very hard I don't even know who's on the roster honestly because like I said they, they I thought Jalen Leck was on the roster now he got traded for TJ Leaf like it's like I don't even know who's on the team anymore I don't know they got a lot of picks and they got three guys in Ariza, who I think is still on the team, George Hill, and Al Horford, who will probably, well, Horford probably is going to be here through the year. It's, it's, he's a new Chris Paul in terms of like, hey, hope he plays well enough to where like, you could trade him in the next offseason for like a for like a decent uh, decent size haul. Um, but like I said, George Hill, he'll be flipped. Either if it's not if it's not before the season, he'll be flipped at some point before the trade deadline because everybody's going to want a vent point guard that can shoot like 40% from three. Similar thing with Ariza, I've seen that. As good of a shooter as George Hill was last year, but you know, solid wing guy can play a little defense, can knock down some threes. Like he has no purpose on a tanking team. There's, I mean, you need some vets, but like Horford's going to be that guy. You don't need and Trevor Reza. Um, there's no reason for him. Uh, the same with George Hill. They're on shorter term deals. Horford still got three years left. It's going to be hard for him to move. All right, you got to understand that. Um, but like I said, George Hill, he was out there. I don't see them making it through the season. With them. They might even make the training camp with the Thunder, for all we know. So, like I said, a lot of moves that were made, a lot of moves that will continue to be made. And as they come in, we will continue to discuss them. So, after we come back here, we will discuss the college football. Um, we will discuss college football from this past weekend, Saturday. Um, again, another very eventful weekend. Some very good matchups, very good games, very tight games, some interesting outcomes, and all that stuff. So, we will discuss those right after the break. Stay right there. Are you looking to get your college football fix? Looking to get the latest news on your favorite school's team? The GSMC College Football Podcast is your ticket to all things college football. Join us as we talk college football from the national championship, the college rivalries, the bowl game, to the Heisman Trophy, to which conference is the best. We've got you covered for the Big Ten, SEC, Big 12, the Pac-12, ACC, and everything in between. Download the GSMC College Football Podcast on iTunes, Stitcher, SoundCloud, Google Play, or anywhere you find podcasts. Just type GSMC in the search bar. Looking around the college football landscape from this past weekend, one of the bigger matchups uh, from the weekend was number three Ohio State versus number nine Indiana. And though it was looking very shaky at a certain point, or it was well more so in the first half and early in the third quarter, the Indiana Ohio State game lived up to the hype, in my own personal opinion, and to each his own. But in my own personal opinion, it lived up to the hype. It was it ended up obviously being very competitive. It was very competitive even through the first quarter and even a part of the way through the second quarter. The issue was just that, like, Indiana just couldn't capitalize on on turnovers from Justin Fields. Like, this is one of, if not the worst game, I think I may have seen Justin Fields play in college. I just, like, 
just like if he threw, he had what three interceptions this game, um, just just making plays and making throws and decisions. And I'm just like, what are you doing, buddy? Like, like why? Like I said, just like sometimes, and I feel like that's the the issue with quarterbacks that are supremely athletic and have utilized that athleticism in order to like get them to where they're at in college is that like they trust themselves a little bit too much. Like, like I feel like you have to learn sometimes that hey, look, taking a sack. In certain scenarios, like I said, not every scenario, because sometimes you can't afford to take a sack. But if it's take a sack or force a or force a throw into into coverage, like no, like how about we just take the sack and not give the ball up, so at least we can punt. Um, same thing with like throwing the ball away. Like hey, look, it's like instead of maybe like trying to force a throw in there, um, when the guys are all around us, let's like this maybe like throw it at the guy's feet or like or dirt it or something. Or like I said, or if you're out of the pocket, just throw it away. Like there's no reason to. To force a pass that you don't have to force. I said there, there was a couple, couple of those throws there. Obviously, I do think Justin Fields would would have liked to have had back if the scenarios were different. But obviously, they weren't. Um, so, like I said, he had a couple interceptions there in the first half. And the biggest story was that Indiana could do nothing with them. So after his first interception, it's seven nothing. After the after I say drives down the field, not even really drives down the field. They they had a a, a long pass to to Garrett Wilson. On the first play, and then uh, another Garrett Wilson touchdown. I mean, another Garrett Wilson catch for a touchdown um, after that. So, like I said, just Justin Fields, the Garrett Wilson drive, two plays, 75 yards, and a touchdown. Take about 30 seconds. Then, let's say the next drive on the first play, Justin Fields throws an interception. Then, subsequently, Indiana goes four and out. They aren't able to get a, a fourth and two. Um, try to throw to Fry Four. I forget this is the one, one of the ones that he, would, he dropped if it was a bad throw. I don't know. Because the Fry Four, they've had a couple of drops early. And then obviously got it together. Um, and then um, they they get another interception later in the later in the half. This time, uh, so it's no later in the first quarter, I should say. Um, get another interception, um, and this time they go three plays, negative one yards, and have to punt. Um, so like I said, that's that's two, that's um two turnovers, and they don't even well like they get they they get one first down out of all of them. As like I said, that's not really ideal uh after turnover offense. Like I said both were in good well, the first one wasn't in that good of field position. No, wait, take that I'm looking at the wrong thing. The um, the like both of them were in, in good field position too. That's the worst part. Like the, okay, the first one was at the I'll say forty four you started the drive and the second one you started at the Indiana forty three. So you're in um you're in good field position to potentially like, hey at least drive a little bit, get get twenty three yards, you at least get a field goal out of it. Like I said, they weren't able to do that on either of the two drives, like I said, it was seven nothing for a while. They were eventually able to tie it up seven seven, um, but then Ohio's offense started clicking a little bit. Um, after it went seven seven, they tied. They went up fourteen seven on a massive T forty one yard run. Then they forced a punt. Then they went up and scored again. This time on another massive T run after a Justin Fields run uh, of thirty yards to set him up. Um, then the next drive, Indiana again moved the ball uh, a little bit. Uh, after a big after a big pass, but then um, but then uh, they had a fumble that was forced at the house at like thirteen. So like I said, they could potentially cut the lead to twenty one fourteen. Um, then they fumbled. Then Ohio State scored again before the half. So like I said, um, two turnovers from Ohio State they weren't able to capitalize on, and then they turn over. Then they had to turn over their own in plus territory. And like I said, that's for a team that needs. Um. For a team that needs to take advantage of as many opportunities as you could, um, they weren't really able to capitalize on those, especially early on, and that's kind of why. And that's kind of why they were in the situation where they were in, um, where like I said, they were they were fighting from behind um, in that in that second half. I said they capitalized on either those either those two first two interceptions, or they don't fumble. In Ohio State, in deep in Ohio State territory, we're potentially looking at a game where again they lost by seven, but that's a completely different, um, that's a completely different scenario. Where like I said maybe, maybe they're tied or maybe they're driving to like instead of on their last drive, um, well, well not necessarily their last drive, um, but on their next last drive because the last drive they they were you know they have to do the whole, um, they had what thirty seconds left to try to go to the length of the field like that wasn't really gonna happen. Um, but I'm saying like the next last drive where they have to, where they're able to get a stop and they, they get the ball back with like four and a half minutes left. 
maybe they're tied or maybe they're even up when they when that happens. So like again, maybe they're driving to like take the lead or they're driving to seal off the the, the game as opposed to driving and being down and having to try to force yourself to score. Like I said, if they capitalize on any of those early in that first half or just in the first half in general, maybe things are differently. How they came out of the half. Um, uh, scored another touchdown. Indiana did come back with a touchdown, so it was 35-14. Then they forced another Justin Fields, uh, forced another Justin Fields interception. And um, don't really... But then they forced a fumble. And then Ohio State is able to recover. Um, so like I said, that that's that's rough. Because like I said, just like just go down or, like, or just hold on to the ball. And so that's another turnover they forced that didn't amount to anything. Then they, they get a three and out after that. They force a punt. And then this is when Indiana started picking it up. They scored to get it to 21-35. That next drive, Ohio State was a field goal. Boom. Um... No, not boom. I, I apologize. Um, cause then, um, then, then it's all right, cool. They got a little momentum. It's 31 21. Then, um, Penn Hager Jr. tries to throw a, a deep, uh, a deep out. And, uh, Sean Wade undercuts it and picks it off and runs it back. Uh, 36 yards for touchdown. That ended up being the decisive score. But like I said, the next two drives, Indiana comes down the field, scores in 10 plays and scores in two plays. Now it's 42 35. And like I said, without that pick six, like maybe maybe they're maybe it's at least tied, maybe they're leading, like you never you never know. And like I said, they were able to like I said, they were able to get some stops there down the stretch, have some chances to drive. But like I said, the 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 key drive there was after the turnover on downs they forced. They they weren't able to move the ball. They had the ball, like I said, four and four thirty left, um, got a first down, and then went four plays. Well it went three plays and had the punt. So, like I said, that was really the game. But, like I said, shout out to Indiana. They're, they're definitely a lot closer than people gave them credit for. I think the spread for this game, like, they were, like, 21 and a half point underdogs. And, again, it was looking very shaky in the beginning. But, like I said, they clearly they don't give up. Clearly they fought. So, shout out to them. Um, like I said, does it matter? N- no, because they end up losing. But, still, impressive, an impressive showing from, from, their, from their standpoint. Um, so, yeah, that was a good game. Also... In the good game territory, you got Northwestern, Wisconsin. This one was completely different, much more of a defensive matchup. Um, but shout out to Northwestern. Um, moved to 5-0, and got the win. And granted, it was at home, but still got the win. Um, like I said, just, just then Graham Mertz did not have himself a good day. Um, was 23-41, of 41, 230, one touchdown, three interceptions. Um, like I said, he, he had looked good his first two weeks, but th- this one was not really it for him. Uh, Ramsey... The, the Indiana transfer, if I remember correctly, um, did enough of what he had to do at 203 yards through the air, two touchdowns. Um, so like I said, didn't have like a great day, but like I said, did what he had to do. Um, got the scores. Like I said, their defense, they recovered a couple fumbles, um, had a couple sacks. Like I said, had three interceptions. So I think they would have five turnovers in general. Um, so like I said, that's all. That's all. If your defense is going to show up like that and you're only going to hold a team to seven points, all right, as long as your your offense doesn't screw things up, like you're you're gold. And as I said, that's that's what happened. Their their offense and their defense did what they had to do. The offense did what they had to do enough. Like I said, they still had their own issues. Had to, had a fumble of their own after they uh, they forced a fumble in Wisconsin. Um, had a missed field goal. Also, again, they could have they could have put potentially more points on the board. Had had a lot of punts, especially in the second half. There's a lot of punts, um, <laughs> turnover on downs, things like that. Like. And then they had another fumble late, too. So, not a whole lot of offense. But, again, Northwestern still got the dub. Still a quality dub. Again, Wisconsin is a very good team. They were, what, number 10 ranked team in the country at the time. So, again, that, that's a nice little win for Northwestern. And now they're they're in good position in the Big Ten West. Like I said, they're, they're, they're the leader. They're potentially going to be facing Ohio State. They'll probably get smoked. But, at least, they, yeah, that's, I mean, that's a cool, it's cool, it's cool for them to at least be in that game. So that was a good one. Um, if you cared to watch it, UCF versus Cincinnati was also a very good one. Um, Cincinnati again was, was, was tested a little bit in this one. They, they were down 14 to three early had to battle back in the, in the second quarter, um, to, to take a lead 1914. They had to battle back in the second half. Um, had to come, come back in the fourth quarter. They were down 25, 22 heading to the quarter. Um, and still have to hold on there at the end after 
UCF scored a touchdown with like 427 left um, to cut the lead to three. So they still have to hold on. They were able to, after that touchdown, they, they, uh, they was going to held the ball for 426. Uh, ended up fumbling on the last play. Um, cost me some money about on that. Cause again, they, they, so, so they get down, because what happens? They get down to like the, the five, right? UCF five. First and goal. It looks like, I don't even know if UCF was trying to score, they were just going to score. And then Dokes was like, hey, you know what? Let me not score. All right, cool. That's fine. So I figured, all right, so they're not going to try to score. Like, hey, just, just knee it out. No, they, they, they decided they were going to, like, try to run actual plays. Weren't able to get in. And from the, They got stuff for no gain on second and third in goal. And they tried to run another play on fourth and goal. It was a bad snap. Um, they, Ritter recovered it, but it didn't matter because he was, he was down. Um, and, you know, the, I think the the spread on the game for them was, like, either four or, like, four and a half, something like that. So, again, he scored a touchdown there. Um, you know, your boy hits his parlay, but it's fine. I'm not I'm not mad about it or anything like that. Um, but speaking of Ritter, he he played very well. He didn't just play well, 21 and 32, two, 338 yards to the air, two touchdowns, no interceptions, had another two touchdowns on the ground. So he's, he's, he's looked very good this year for Cincinnati. He's a big reason why they are where they are this season on top of the fact, on top of their defense, obviously. Um, good defense has been good, picked off Gabriel once. Um, it's like I said there, defense didn't have their best stuff today, but, like I said, if Ritter's going to be playing this well, like, hey, look, sometimes you, you need your offense to, to have themselves a good day and bail you out. And again, this isn't the first time Cincinnati's put up points. They they put up a lot of points this year, but normally the defense has been holding teams under, like, 20 points. And this was the first game where it was like, oh, I mean, UCF's a good offense, too, so let me not, it's not their slouch, but still, you don't expect the defense to show up like that, but again, they made the plays when they had to make them. So that was a good one. Shout out to them. Um, a nice quality win. Um, let's see what else. Oklahoma continues to treat Oklahoma State like a little brother. Just even in a down year, Oklahoma State still isn't that close to Oklahoma. Uh, Spencer Rattler in his first Bedlam game, four touchdowns, 300 yards. Um, Stevenson had 141 yards on the ground. Uh, like I said, it just, who that Wheeze guy? He had two touchdowns on two catches for 40 yards. Uh, what's it called? Sanders. Uh, was 10 of 19 for 97 yards and an interception. Had to bring in somebody else. He was only 5 or 21. Um, and Tyler Wallace was held in check. Um, so yeah, like I said, even in a season where Oklahoma is like not as good as they normally are, and they've gotten a lot better, like I said, since those first two, uh, losses early in the season to Iowa State and Kansas State, they've rattled off, what is this, like five in a row now? And yeah, they've rattled off five in a row now. The offenses look good. Rattlers look better. Um, so maybe him getting benched was good. They still got West Virginia and Baylor left on the schedule. But I'm saying this is legitimate. They could finish out 8-2, which, I mean, isn't great, but it's it's a lot better than where they started at um, when they were 1-2. and two. Um, So like I said, that was a good quality win for them. Um, what else happened? USC got their first dub. I mean, not their dub, but their first, like, easy dub. They didn't have to come back in the last two minutes um, to win that game. This was against uh, Utah, though. They hadn't played yet. Oregon, you got had all they could handle in that regard. Um, UCLA in a situation where their their starting quarterback couldn't play. Um, they had to face a guy that was uh, playing his first collegiate game, if I remember correctly. Um, they first four turnovers, which was big, and especially that one that picked six over there right at the end of the half. Um, that cut the instead of they were going to head into the half down twenty one seventeen and leading twenty four twenty one. Um, so like I said, the turnovers proved critical for Oregon in this game. I said they got four of them, and that's a big reason why they got the dub. Um, so like I said, it's probably a little too close for comfort if you're Oregon, but a win is a win. You only got you only, you only got six games. You got to win all of them at this point. Like I said, they got a game against Oregon State. We'll see how that goes, a game against Cal, and then they play Washington, who's currently undefeated. So um, I said three wins down, three wins to go for them, and then obviously the AFC, uh, not the AFC, the Pac-12 championship game. Assuming they get there. Uh, what else? BYU continues to do their thing. Showed out. Florida. Um, I almost said Alex. Uh, Kyle Trask is firmly in the mix with the Heisman. Um, very much so. He might be. I mean, because Justin Fields kind of took a step back. Obviously, Zach Wilson's still doing his thing. Um, with Mac Jones. I know I talked about him, but some people think if you're going to pick an Alabama guy, it might be Najee Harris. 
even Devontae Smith, he's, he's been kind of amazing. Um, like I said, obviously Trevor Lawrence, but he hasn't, he hasn't played, and they didn't play this past weekend because um, of COVID um, on their own part. But let that with Sweeney tell it. It's a different story. Um, but yeah, I said Kyle Trask continues to play well. Uh, had another three touchdowns, 283 yards. Has 31 touchdowns and three interceptions on the season to go with 2,500 yards. So, again, he's been sensational. Um, then just, like I said, continuing to put up big numbers. And, like I said, he's going to have his chance, hopefully, if assuming they beat Tennessee and Kentucky and LSU to finish out the season. He's got his chance against Alabama. See what he can do. Okay, see, so already faced Georgia. Did, did what he have to do there. Um, could potentially have his chance against Alabama um, to face off in, in like, the SEC championship game and, like, Again, cement not only just his Heisman candidacy, but also like again that case in the college football playoff. So we'll see about that. Um, but yeah, he's he's been amazing. So shout out to him. Um, also, again, this is a quick shout out just because um, I ended up winning. But shout out to Rutgers. Obviously, Rutgers has kind of been the laughing side of, of the Big Ten since they joined. But at the very least, Grace Shiano's got them playing hard. Like I said, the, the Michigan did end up winning eventually in triple overtime. Mind you, they have to, they have to switch quarterbacks just to even kind of. Have 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 hope for a comeback, but like I said, against a team like Michigan, who's he was again ranked, not where where were they ranked, eighteen to open the season, um, and obviously against a Rutgers team who who was not going to be ranked that high, um, and obviously there's a big gap in terms of talent and things like that. Like they play hard, like like they, they there was they could have won this game and they should have won this game. The the kicker just missed in um double overtime, and I think it was double overtime after. After Nordine missed, I'm trying to remember. I think it was double overtime. Yeah, Nordine missed. Um, or no, was it the first overtime? It was the first overtime. So Nordine missed, and you're like, oh, kick Rutgers is gonna is gonna do it. And then like again, I think they played for the field goal, which again, don't ever play for the field goal, ladies and gentlemen, especially not in college. Don't ever play for the field goal. I hate when teams do that. And the brother missed a 45 yarder, and like I said, they went to double overtime. They scored a touchdown there, and then unfortunately they weren't able to score again in triple overtime. But like I said, they had their chance. They, that was that was it right there. And I mean, they'll probably get their statement winning against Penn State in a couple of weeks. But like I said, at least Rutgers is like very competitive now. Even like again against Ohio State, normally they lose by thirty plus. They only lost by what was it twenty two, which is not that bad. Obviously, they lost a close one to Illinois. Um, lost by sixteen to Indiana, and then they beat Michigan State. Obviously, so they got they got Purdue, they got Maryland, and then they got Penn State. I think they can win at least one, if not two, of those games. So if they continue to play how they've been playing, which again is, is hard and physical and like I said, they've been in almost every game, um, more or less. Now obviously the Ohio State game was a little you know, that didn't really um they, they were kinda out of it by halftime. But almost every other game they've been they've been competitive in. Where they at least they got it within like a score and things like that before they were obviously they just weren't able to like, you know, um get the necessary plays made. Like I said, they're they're competitive now, so shout out to them. And obviously, Michigan, obviously, they then Milton's no longer gonna be the quarterback. I would think they're gonna stick with the uh, what's the name McNamara, at least for the next week when they when they play Penn State. I would you would think. Um, I don't I don't know. I'm not I'm not Harbaugh, but I would think that there's no way Milton starts. Not after what we saw in that game, and obviously what McNamara brought for the team. So we'll see about that. But yeah, just want to give a quick shout out to Rockets because obviously, um, they don't get too many shout outs because they don't get that much love. But hey, it is. What it is, so after we come back here, obviously the college football, first official college football playoff ranking will come out on Tuesday, if I remember correctly. So, and like again, and um, to just kind of um, get ahead of that a little bit, I thought I would talk about, because again, I think Clemson, Alabama, Ohio State, and Notre Dame are going to be in the top four, whatever order you want to put them in. Um, I think those will be the first four. So I'm saying of the teams that are going to be outside that first four, which team do I think has the best chance to potentially um, get into the playoff again? Not to say it's going to happen, because that could very well be the four, assuming Notre Dame only Notre Dame's only lost to Clemson in, um, in the ACC championship game. And then obviously Alabama and uh, Ohio State went out. Again, if either of those teams lose, then things get thrown a little bit out of whack. But again, assuming that, and for the sake of this argument, I'll talk about what teams I think have the best chance of potentially, um, well, I guess we'll not take that back. Now that they don't, yeah, I'll, I'll explain it better once we come back here. So uh, we'll discuss that right after the break. Stay right there. 
Check out the show built around the women of MMA from the UFC, Invicta FC, Bellator, and one championship. We got the fights covered. It's the Golden State Media Concepts Women's MMA Podcast. The latest news of upcoming fights, discussions of previous matches. Join us as we talk to and about the biggest names in women's mixed martial arts, past, present, and future. When it's the women's fight game, you know where to listen to the Golden State Media Concepts Women's MMA Podcast. Network. So, um, like I said, just looking around, looking, thinking of the non four, like the non top four teams. Obviously, like when I was talking about the scenario beforehand, there there are obviously instances where, in order for them to get in, that would mean Alabama or Ohio State would have had to catch an L at some point. Um, so again, that doesn't mean that they are necessarily guaranteed to uh, be undefeated. But like I said, obviously, there's a good chance of that happening. And the best chance of somebody to sneak in would be to take Notre Dame's spot. But again, if Notre Dame is only loss is to Clemson in the HC Championship game, I feel like that's probably a good enough loss to potentially, um, or they still have a good enough resume to potentially get in on, on merit without, like I said, over potentially other teams. But like I said, just thought I'd look around at some of those other teams that could potentially be vying for that last playoff spot. Like I said, I think the first three are pretty much locked in. So when you look at the All-State playoff predictor, um, the the four teams, well, technically Clem, uh, Clemson is the fifth team with the highest percentage chance of making the playoffs. Um, the fourth is actually Cincinnati. And then you got Oregon, USC, BYU, Northwestern, um, and then Florida State and Texas A&M. Those, those would be the ones I'll, I'll discuss. So actually, when you go to Cincinnati, I, like I said, I think their case is a very strong one. They got three games left. They got Temple, Tulsa, and the AAC championship game. Winning out probably won't be enough on its own. But, like I said, if any of the other teams above them maybe falter, I think that, that would be enough for them to potentially get in. Like I said, I don't know how they would do. I don't know how they would fare against, like, an Alabama or Ohio State. Um, or even like a Notre Dame or a Clemson, but like I said, the the offensive Ritters playing well is is not is not bad at all. Um, is definitely good enough to compete um, necessarily. And then the defense, if it's on top of its game, is is good as well. So again, it's not impossible for them to compete with any of those teams. Not gonna say they would win um, a game. Maybe they could potentially beat Notre Dame, but that even then, not even hundred percent certain about that. But there's no guarantee that they would get in, um, even if they won out. But like I said. If they want to, that's probably their best case scenario for for um for getting in. And like I said, there's a good chance they'll be able to do that. So like I said they went out, they got a good shot. Um, the next one, Oregon, Oregon USC. Like I said, because um it's a Power Five conference. I think if either of those two teams finishes undefeated, having won the the championship, I think that's a good enough uh chance for either of those two teams to get in. Um, on merit, like I said, if, if, if one of the other teams were to fall out, like I said, I don't think they'll leapfrog any team. Like, again, I mean, I guess in theory, like, again, you're talking about potentially leapfrogging Notre Dame. That's, that's really what we're talking about here. If, if, like, a Florida or, um, I guess a Northwestern doesn't beat, like, Ohio State or Alabama in their conference championship game. Like I said, if those, if those, if Clemson, Alabama, Ohio State, as many people predict, win their, win their conference championship, like, is there a team that could leapfrog Notre Dame? And I, like I said, Oregon or USC could be that team, just because as of right now, they're both leading their um, division. Um, like I said, Oregon's got three more games, one against Oregon State, one against Cal, and then one against Washington, who's currently also undefeated at this point. USC's obviously got three more games, too. 
One against Colorado is undefeated, one against Washington State, and then one against UCLA to finish out the season. So again, if both those teams are 6-0 heading into their matchup, again, that's not not the most high-quality uh, matchup, on, on paper at least. Again, in like um, ranking-wise, it might be, especially if USC keeps winning, they'll keep climbing up the rankings. And um, I imagine Oregon will already be in the top 10. So like I said, not, not necessarily a bad matchup by any means. But like I said, I don't know if that'll if that'll be enough. That, that matchup will have enough cachet to be like, oh, right, yeah, this is a quality win. Obviously, they'll be over a top twenty five opponent. Both teams are undefeated, things like that. Um, like I said, I don't know if that'd be enough to leapfrog Notre Dame, per se. But again, I think any team in the conference championship, or any team that plays in a conference championship game, would have a good shot at um, unseating Notre Dame, assuming they lost in the conference championship. Again, if they win, then. All bets are off. Then I said Clemson's definitely out. Something like that. That makes things even easier for like a team like Cincinnati or an Oregon or USC or things like that. Because Clemson have two losses. They'll be there, there's no way that they're getting in with two losses. Like there's just there's no way you could justify putting them in with two losses, especially two losses. The same thing. Like there's no way you justify putting them in with two losses. Um. So like I said, this is all. That's under the assumption that Notre Dame is the one to get to the L. Um. Again, also if you're looking at uh. I guess what was the other one? BYU? I mean, BYU, it's tough. Just because, again, they're doing everything they can. Zach Wilson and the offense doing everything they can. But I think they only got, like, one game left. Uh, I think they're talking about potentially, what was it, Washington? They're talking about potentially maybe trying to schedule a game with just because they, they have an off week the 5th of December. BYU does. And I think Washington will as well due to um, COVID situation. I could be wrong about that. I do want to double check on that, but yeah, the Washington State game. No, no, no. Okay, so no, this is this is, is this upcoming weekend. Um, because yeah, the Washington State game has been canceled. So if they can, if they can do that, I believe. But I think BYU already potentially turned it down just because they wanted to see where they were at in the rankings first, just to see if it's worthwhile to, to try to play this game. Because again, if you try to fit this game in and it really doesn't do anything for you, like there's no real point. Of risking it and like ruining your perfect record, but if this could potentially sneak you into the playoff, if you if you get a another quality win under your belt, then hey, look, maybe you do risk it. Um, like I said, and there's no guarantee that they would or wouldn't. But like I said, I think that that's what I think. I thought Washington extended the offer, and BYU was like, yeah, like we don't not want to play, but um. Also, we do want to check some things first again, like COVID wise and also like ranking wise. So again, we'll see if that kind of happens. That'd be that'd be a good one for uh, both teams to potentially again have another matchup um, of, of a quality opponent on their resume if they got if they were able to win it. As at BYU, I think their shot is basically almost zero um, of getting in. Unfortunately for them, like I said, it's unfortunate, um, but it's just it's not. I don't think it's gonna. I don't. I don't think BYU is really gonna really gonna have a shot to to get in to the college football playoff. Even though again they might still go undefeated, they would need like I said they would need a lot of help to get in. So not impossible, but just um, pretty unlikely at this point in time. In my opinion, again we'll see. But again, being independent, um, it, it would be too difficult. With no, like I said, no conference championship game It's gonna be too hard. Um, for them to have the necessary resume to get in. But again, you never know. And then, uh, I guess going to two SEC schools. Um, again, if either of them, them being Florida or Texas A&M. So I guess with Texas A&M, they would need to, uh, they would need to find a way for Alabama to lose so that they could, uh, potentially sneak into the SEC title game because obviously they're, they're, they're behind Alabama at the moment in the standings. So that they can't obviously get in. Unless they find a way to get into the championship game, because you're not gonna you're not gonna sneak into the championship game by not playing. I don't think the playoff committee will reward them in that regard. And like I said, Florida has a different chance. Like I said, they went out their last three games, and you beat Alabama in the championship game. I think that their resume will be good enough with the win over Georgia. Obviously, they have the loss to Texas A&M, which will definitely hurt. I'm saying a win on the road against Georgia, who was number five at the time, and then beating Alabama in the AC cha- in the SEC championship game. Excuse me. I think those are two quality enough wins to where they could potentially get in. Now, the question would be, will they get in over one loss Alabama team? Now, that's a different story. Don't know 
if they will, but again, I feel like it'd be hard to justify leaving the SEC championship, leaving the SEC champion, excuse me, out of the playoff. Uh, I, I, I just feel like that, that that's a hard sell because it's like if that's the case, then what's the point of playing championship games? And again, I, I believe this kind of things come up in the past. So this will be the first time for this argument, but again, like you need to incentivize having championship games. The reason why the Big Twelve has one is like, like a lot of conferences have one because not a lot of conferences have one, but like. Conferences have them now because of stuff like this. Because they were like, "Hey, we if we just do like it outright, then um, we don't get the benefit of that extra game to potentially pad our pad our resume." So, like I said, if if Florida wins against Alabama in the SEC championship game and then doesn't get in, it's like, what is the point? Like, basically, you're just saying we're just going to pick Alabama, Florida, uh, or Ohio State and Clemson every year. That's basically what you're saying. And then like everyone else is just fighting for fourth, which I mean they generally are, but. Like I said, if, if 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 we can beat them in the championship game and still not get in, then then what? Then how can we get in? Like obviously they could they could have not lost Texas A and M. That's fair. Um, and this is obviously Texas A and M is currently well in the AP, but like they're five, so it's not like it's a bad team they lost. It was a it was a it was a quality team they lost to, and it was on the road. I said it was in it was at Texas A and M. So again, like that's not that's that's not the worst loss ever. It's not like they got smoked. Like, they, they lost on a last-second field goal. So, again, it, it's it's no it's no guarantee that, that either of those teams will get in, but I'd, I'd feel like, though, that would be their best chance. Like I said, Texas A&M's a little bit longer shot since they're in the division with Alabama, and they already caught that L to Alabama once. And, like, it wasn't even close. They got smoked. So, like I said, that, that that's a tough one to sell, you, to sell me on. Um, and obviously they've been hurt a little bit by COVID. They've lost two games. Not, I mean, a lot of, a lot of schools around the country have been losing games to COVID. So that's nothing new. Um, but yeah, like I said, it's, it's not, um, it's not impossible, but I feel like it's definitely going to be difficult to try to find a way to get a non, and I guess I thought, forgot about Northwestern, but again, same, similar scenario. They went out, beat beat Ohio State. Like they're they're in, in like not in theory, they're in. Um, you would think. So like I said, that's why. When you look at the playoff predictor, or I think this is some tweet this out from ESPN analytics. You look at the playoff predictor, like, um, if it ended today, Alabama was a lock, Notre Dame's almost a lock, Ohio State like gets in three out of every four times, and as of right now, Cincinnati would be in, but that's mainly just because Clemson has the one loss. Um, and then it'd be Northwestern, Texas A&M, and then BYU. I'm surprised Florida's not up there, but it's because they probably lost Texas A&M. And then Texas A&M's one lost to Alabama. So like I said, it's a little bit different. But yeah. And USC is there too. Um, but yeah, so like I said, if, if, if things hold and Clemson, like I said, wins an ACC championship game against Notre Dame, then I feel like regardless, like again, assuming Alabama and Ohio State both win their conference, then I feel like those would be your four teams. Now, if Clemson loses, that changes some things. And and if, like I said, if Ohio State or Alabama loses, that changes some things. Like I said, if Clemson, Ohio State, Alabama win the division and win their conference, then I feel like Notre Dame's one loss being in the conference championship game will be enough to justify the playoff community putting them in over, like I said, an undefeated um, Cincinnati and undefeated BYU uh, maybe even, like I said, it just, like, those two, again, assuming Alabama doesn't lose to Florida in, in the SC Championship game, and, like, Ohio State doesn't lose to, like, Northwestern or somebody in the SC Championship, AC, Big Ten, excuse me, Championship game. Like I said, if if those things happen, then, like, the whole playoff is, is going to be completely different. But like I said, assuming those things hold, and then Clemson beats Notre Dame, I feel like it's going to be tough for Cincinnati to get in. I would love to see them in. I think it'd be really cool. But I just feel like it would be tough if you're the one, either though they're undefeated or they would be undefeated in this hypothetical. If Clemson's one loss is in the AC, is, is, ah, if Notre Dame's one loss in the ACC championship game, and then Clemson's one loss is to Notre Dame at Notre Dame without Trevor Lawrence, I feel like even with those one loss, I think they'll they'll give you give those guys the benefit of the doubt over Cincinnati. Like I said, no guarantee. It's it's not it's it's not impossible that. Uh, that Cincinnati finds a way into the playoff. Like I said, it'd be really cool if they did. But, uh, like I said, it's just going to be tough. 
because then you just look at their opponents and while they're smoking people and and that's all you could really can do don't have too many quality opponents obviously you're going to hope that Telso is still ranked at the time when would you play them because that'll be a piece of quality win they beat SMU when they were ranked they beat Army when they were ranked so again they will have had like three ranked wins and a potential conference championship on their resume which isn't nothing um, but like I said, it'll probably be too hard to overcome uh, Notre Dame's one loss being only to Clemson. But I think it, I think that's why you play the games. You got to see how it all plays out, how things all shake out. Because maybe, like I said, maybe Clemson loses again. Um, and like I said, you don't worry about that. Maybe Alabama or Ohio State loses, so you don't worry about that um, kind of thing. So, yeah, we'll see kind of what happens. But I know some of those, like the, the Cincinnati's, the BYU's, the Oregon's, the USC's, the Florida's, Texas A&M. Those guys are definitely on the outside, going to be on the outside looking in in the first playoff ranking, I believe. Um, and then, like I said, depending on how close they are, we'll just tell you how good of a chance they have of actually making it into the playoff if something in the top four, or someone in the top four sides that, which basically almost always happens. So we'll kind of see how that goes when and if that does go down. But that'll do it for me here today on the GSMC Sports Podcast, presented by GSMC Podcast Network. I want to thank you guys for always listening to me talk about sports. If you haven't already, subscribe to the podcast. Make sure you never miss an episode. Make sure you're always on top when we drop our latest stuff. Also, if you could please as well, give us a five-star rating for our with you. Very appreciated, very helpful. I'll see what you guys like, what you, what you guys dislike, so we can improve, all that fun stuff, wherever you listen to your podcast at. Also, if you could please as well. Um, well, not if you could please as well, but if you have social media, and you want to discuss some of these topics with us there, whether you want to, whether you want to talk about the NFL, um, some of the games from this past weekend, talk, preview like the Monday night game, um, preview the Thanksgiving Day games. I'm um, talking about, I said, uh, all the different craziness that's happened in the last three, four days in the NBA and in their offseason, talk about college football and which teams you think have a good chance that aren't named Alabama, Clemson, Ohio State, or Notre Dame to make it actually into the playoff if things break right for them. I said all that fun stuff. You can talk about us on social media. So Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, you can find us there. We can talk, we can chat, we can debate, we can discuss before I get out of here. As always, do want to shout out the essential workers and that have been working tirelessly through this pandemic to make sure that people like me and my family and everyone around us is safer. Um, again, they do a lot of thankless stuff. A lot of people still aren't taking it seriously as they should, and that's unfortunate. But again, I appreciate the work you guys do to help make sure that we are as safe as we can be um, wherever we're at. So said doctors, nurses, EMTs, first responders, firefighters, postal service workers, uh, retail workers, grocery store workers, FedEx, UPS, Amazon, all, like I said, anybody's going to be essential. If I kiss, I missed you. Um, I appreciate your work. Appreciate everything you've done. Um, we're going to be like this for a while, which is very unfortunate for you because like, you've been working very hard for the last nine plus months and there's no real end in sight with this. It's only getting worse. Um, so that's highly unfortunate. But again, I appreciate the work that you have done up until this point and will continue to do um, moving forward. Also, again, shout out to like the delivery services like Uber or Lyft. Uber Eats, Postmates, DoorDash, um, against the car, place like that. Go, anything that allows us to not have to like travel and leave our house to do things, or if we do travel, you can do it in like a car, and you can both be wearing masks, and everything's easy as opposed to making maybe taking public transportation or something like that. Um, like I said, all those different services you are appreciated. Um, I know a lot of people are a lot of places are already not a lot. The places are already starting to shut down, like the dining. Um, so like I said, the restaurant industry is definitely going to be hit hard. My like men industry is going to be hit hard during this winter. Um, do there going to be, is there going to be a rise of cases and things like that? It's going to be kind of a bit of a mess. Um, so if you can still, uh, dine, preferably outdoors, if you can still dine, tip your waiters, tip your waitresses, tip your bartenders appropriately. Like I said, it's going to be a rough winter for them. It's going to be a rough winter for a lot of us, but it's going to be a rough winter for them. So if you can, please tip generously. I imagine it'll go a long way and it will be very appreciated. For those people, also, wear your mask. It's very simple. But yeah, I'm Chris Blades. That has been my time. And until next time, peace out. You've been listening to the Golden State Media Concepts Sports Podcast. 
part of the Golden State Media Concepts Podcast Network. You can find this show and others like it at www.gsmcpodcast.com. Download our podcast on iTunes, Stitcher, SoundCloud, and Google Play. Just type in GSMC to find all the shows from the Golden State Media Concepts Podcast Network. From movies to music, from sports to entertainment, and even weird news. You can also follow us on Twitter and on Facebook. Thank you, and we hope you have enjoyed today's program.